We want to fight for something and we want to win. I mean, yeah. that's just a human thing. And when you lose those things, it can be really tough, especially when ever since you were eight years old, this is all you wanted to do. MVP is as an organization. We bring together combat vets and former professional athletes and we help them find purpose and identity when they lose a uniform. It's the big question we all face, especially after graduation. What are we going to do with the rest of our lives? But if you feel directionless, don't worry. You're not alone. Today's guest, Nate Boyer, didn't have a clear path after high school. He dropped out of college and spent a year swabbing the deck on a fishing boat. And yet, he eventually achieved some incredible things. He became a Green Beret, a walk-on player for the University of Texas Longhorns. He played for the Seattle Seahawks and even went on to write, direct, and star in a feature film. Today, Nate dedicates much of his time and energy to a nonprofit called MVP, which connects combat veterans and former professional athletes, where they help each other transition back to civilian life after leaving their uniforms behind. And despite achieving all this, he's just getting started. The happiest moments of my life are never at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. It's like when I'm training before I even go and I'm preparing and I'm like, I don't even know if I can do this, can I do this? And like that excitement of just going for it and, and like, I'm gonna make this movie and the excitement of like sitting down and starting to write this script and figure out like, we're gonna do this and the, those feelings, you know, am I gonna, yeah. staying in the Motel 6 and preparing myself to go try out for the football team, it was awesome to play, I loved it, but I felt happier when I was just putting myself out there and getting ready to go try it and you know, not so worried about the result. Nate is the epitome of what having a growth mindset looks like and what it means to unleash your full potential. If you're looking for some inspiration and practical steps to finding your next calling, you've come to the right place. Nate, welcome to Dad Saves America. Thank you, John. I'm excited to have you here because so much of what we're about on this show is mental health and mindset and trying to talk to people that have a growth mindset and can model that in what they do and can speak to it and can share that story. And to me, like that <laughs> growth mindset is like you practically have a, have a sign floating over, over your head as far as like the amount of things you've done in your life. So I want to I want to take us back to the moment before you knew where you wanted to be. You're in high school mm. and you know, I have an 18 year old, soon to be 18 year old, and you don't know what you want to do, right? So start me there. I still don't, first of all, <laughs> fully. Yeah, you know, I, growing up, and I still am a huge sports fan, but I was a huge sports fan. I, when I was three years old, I would sit in front of the TV and watch like an entire baseball game, which is incredibly boring. And my, my, my mom was always like, I don't understand how you do this, but I was just obsessed. And then it became like memorizing batting averages and all these things. So I was just like- yeah, You this geek is, out. Yes, super geek. This is all I love. This is all I want to do. I'm going to be a pro athlete one day. You know what I mean? And uh, that's, and I was like, serious about it. Well, I was serious about my whole life, but it was like, there's no plan B there. It wasn't like this. It was this or bust. And it was, it was, there was various sports I played. I was not great at any of them. I was a good athlete that worked really hard, but I was like six man on the basketball team. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I think I was first team all league in baseball, but like as a utility player, cause it was like, they could put me anywhere. I'll do different right. things, but it wasn't, I wasn't a standout. I had no scholarship offers or anything like that. So. And how tall are you? I'm, I say 5'11", but I'm 5'10 and change. Yeah. So, cause we, we had um, Ben Askren on the show and okay, you guys yeah. actually share a lot in that way. Like kind of coming up and it was like, I'm just going to overcome the fact that I'm not the biggest or the strongest with sheer right. force of will. Right. So, okay. So you want to be a, pro athlete and there's no second option kind of but, I, but I you're remember. not the, you're not the superstar you're no. not coming out of like high school sports like mvp no not at all i remember sitting in my uh parent in like the office at my parents house and with my dad and my mom and i'm about i'm about 17 at this time and they're just sort of urging me to consider other options while still being supportive parents that are like we believe in you However, you could also get an accounting degree. Yes, you can, which my sister got, you know, <laughs> you can do anything else also, you know, yeah. because that's really tough. And even if you make it, you know, it won't, probably won't last that long. And it's like in their mind, they're not like, wrong. Dude, come on, bro. Get out of here. You're 150 pounds soaking wet. Like it's not going to happen. 
I played baseball, I played basketball. I actually didn't play football growing up. It was my favorite sport because the Niners were a dynasty when I was a kid and I grew up in the Bay Area. Joe Montana. Yeah, Joe Montana, but I just never played. I didn't play when I was young. And then like by the time I got to high school, I ended up graduating from high school, didn't have a team. It just never happened. At that point, I was like, well, if I'm not gonna play sports in college, then why am I going to college? So I'm just not gonna go. You know? Really? Yeah. So what, what did that mean? Did you start at a school and then drop out or did you just decide? No, it's ex I mean, pretty much. So I, I, I moved to San Diego um, right after high school. I had a couple buddies that I graduated with that were going to uh, firefighting school down there, right? Yeah. For, uh, at Mesa College, it's a, a junior college that has like a fire science program. And I was like, oh, that sounds cool. You know, maybe I'll go do that. So I moved down there with them and I started going to classes. I actually, I went to basketball tryouts. I went to baseball tryouts. I, I made it to like the last cut on basketball. So I it's start... all pointing towards NFL success from the start. Totally, <laughs> totally. And you know, I, I go out for the baseball team and I'm like playing in their, sort of their off season program. Yeah. And I maybe, that maybe could have worked out, but I could tell, I mean, I was one of the least of, of the team. You know what I mean? And I wasn't really feeling um, school at all. As far as being a firefighter, super honorable job. And I was like, man, this is really cool, but it's also a ton of responsibility. I'm 18 years old. I'm not ready to grow up. And like, if I do this, if I go all in on this, I, I, at least at the time I felt like, well, I'll be, you know, this will be it. I'll be trapped in this world and I will, I will, I will live my life as a firefighter. And I'm not sure yet. So why would sure. I continue on? So I dropped out. And what'd your parents say at this point? My parents were amazing, man. Like I know they were disappointed, they were hurt, they were worried about me, but they, they at least, when, <laughs> at least to me and around me, they were you know, always pretty positive and like started working on a fishing boat. So at least I was working and kind of doing different things. And, Down in Southern California? Yeah, in San Diego. Okay. Yep. So they were, you know, they were proud of that. My dad, my dad grew up uh, in Southern Oregon. He loves to fish and hunt and do these kind of things. So he was like, that's cool. You know, he's 18 at nine, you know, turning yeah. 19, like this is fine. But, you know, my mom, she got her PhD from UC Berkeley in environmental science. She's, you know, they're both very smart people and very accomplished. And so I'm, I right. know in the back of their heads, they're like, all right, man. Like yeah, at some point, it's going to click at some point. Um, and it didn't for a while. <laughs> it took a long time. But did you, were you hard on yourself during that time? Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I feel like, and this is a theme we'll come back to in our conversation up quite a bit, but one of the things that, is happening in this country in particular is there is there are a lot of young men at that age and older who are lost mm. you know who are out of the workforce they're not even included on in the unemployment rate because they're just they're deemed to be not looking for work and you could have been one of those like all right 18 not sure what i'm going to do right. where am i headed yeah i mean the last thing I wanted to do, first and foremost, was ask my parents for help. <laughs> you know, I did not want to do that. I, I wanted to do it on my own, whatever it was. But I did want to work. I, I enjoy working. I like having a purpose. I like, you know, kind of punching the clock. I like hard work. I like something yeah. that's, you know, a little bit physically demanding. And I think that blue, the blue collar existence was very appealing to me. They're because, not going to get replaced by AI anytime soon. Right. Being on a fishing boat. <laughs> How Chat do you GPT, know? fish I mean, GPT. Come on, I don't know there's going to be robots and freaking. <laughs> yes. Have you seen these robots? They can barely, they can barely walk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so did you already, did you have that from the, from like an early age, like being physical and I mean, trying to get my teenage son to clean his room is like, Pull well, teeth. I mean, I didn't like to do that stuff. No. <laughs> and it's like, of course, a big part of it is, is this something that you want to do or somebody else wants you to do? Yeah. I want to chase my dreams or whatever they are and, and kind of pursue those things. And so jobs like that, working on the fishing boat was really cool because we were out there, you know, on the water, sort of felt like you were in uncharted territory a little bit. Well, and the like, ocean is, is magical. So you're out there on this how deep would it get? How far offshore would you go? We'd go 100 miles or so. Oh, you would? Yeah, we'd go out there. So would, you, would it be like no land, 360? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's, exactly. that's a pretty crazy thing, actually, when yeah. you're out there that far out where you're in probably not that big of a boat, right? Yeah, no, 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 not that big of a boat. I mean, you know, I was a deckhand, and it was just, it was exciting, you know, and it was, it was fun, and, um, and like I said, hard work. I mean, it's like 18-hour days when you're doing it. Um, but it paid really good for an 18-year-old kid. 
it worked. It worked for me. I mean, eventually it was like I, I actually became interested in film and TV world, storytelling really more than anything uh, around that, that time, about 19. So I moved from San Diego to L.A. What was that? What was the life. spark of that? You know, where, um, you know, you're on this boat. So you're in Southern California, so yeah. you're not that far from, you know, Hollywood. It was, once again, similar to the, fire, the firefighting thing. I had a buddy that was going to move up there and, and wanted to be an actor. And I was like, well, that sounds cool. I, I think I just still didn't, had no clue what I wanted to do. I always loved movies. I mean, it inspired me since I was a kid. Oh, yeah. You know, in various yeah. genres. And Well, and you're, you and I are close in age, and we were just talking before cameras started rolling that, uh, you know, we grew up in, like, the Spielberg, the best of Spielberg, the, the 80s movies, you know, E.T., Indiana Jones. E.T. was the first movie I saw in a theater. I don't actually remember it. But my mom, she talks about it all the time. She's like, I sat there and I was just like locked in. Yeah, and it was magic. Mesmerized. So what happens next? So you moved to Los Angeles. Moved to Los Angeles. Once again, started working odd jobs. I you know, worked in a movie theater for a little while. I actually lived out of my car for like five months because... It was cheaper. You Did know, your parents I, know you were living in no, your car? I no, say. I didn't tell. I told them I was couch surfing and, you know, I mean, right. once in a while I did sleep on a couch or something, but yeah, I, I had a little, little Honda Civic hatchback and um, wasn't super comfortable, but I had all my stuff in there. When you're 19, like you're fine. You can sleep anywhere. You know, th your back doesn't hurt yet. Like it doesn't matter. <laughs> and then, uh, and I would, and if it was nice out, take my sleeping bag into like a park, like Will Rogers Park in like Beverly Hills, you know, and just like, hey, this is great. And just stay the night and then wake up. It's a different experience in 2023 than it was back then. Yeah, yeah, that was in uh, <laughs> 2000. So that's 23 years ago. Yeah. Totally different. You get animated to try to get out there in the world and you end up going to Darfur. What is the spark of that? How do you go from living in your car, wanting to be maybe an actor, to, I need to put my hands to use helping people that are in dire straits at the global level. Like, wh what happens? What's the thing that happens? Well, the first thing that happened was 9-11. At that, at that point, 2001, so now I'm 20 years old, I was living in a uh, little studio apartment that had a Murphy bed, you know. I was loving it, because like, yeah. this is really cool. It's Not a car or a boat. <laughs> no, no. It's a stationary home. Exactly. <laughs> and it was a cool part of town, it was like, I don't know if you know where Franklin Village is in, uh, I don't, but in L.A., but yeah. it was, it was, it's kind of got a mini, very mini, you know, Brooklyn feel to it, kind of. And it was this old brick building. I was like, this is cool. It was kind of, you know, Hollywood romantic idea. And I started writing a little bit for the first time in my life, and, uh, but still just not sure if this is going to stick or if this is what I'm actually into. I was just kind of floating around. And then 9-11 and happens. My mom called me, you know, 5 in the morning in L.A. time, and tells me I turn the TV on, I turn it on, I see mm -hmm. what's happening. Yeah. And that's what sparked it. But I didn't, I didn't actually go to the Darfur for like three more years. I did travel around, I'd save my money up, I'd go backpack somewhere and kind of travel, see the world, you know, as a tourist. But no purpose behind that. And what was it? I mean, obviously 9-11 was, and I was in New York for 9-11, was traumatic and crazy and like world shifting. But can you articulate the the spark there? A part of it was seeing how we seem to really come together on 912. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's true. This, that was inspiring. I thought that was really interesting. But also it was like this, how, how can something like this happen in, in you know, 2001 in our world today? I didn't, I was just so shut off to the rest of the world and not understanding that, you know, many people live in some very dire environments yeah. at all times. And this is like, not that this isn't a terrible tragedy, but like we're very fortunate that this this doesn't happen often. You know what I mean? Yeah, this is not normal for us, but bombings are normal for totally a lot of people in the world. Totally, and just yeah, general struggle, you know, and oppression, and like all these other things at like a very high level. Yeah, and so I was studying a bit of that and kind of learning about that, but not really experiencing it and not really doing anything to help fix that. And, I, and it started just weighed on me and weighed on me and weighed on me. You end up going into the military, but not at that point, which is interesting. Yeah. Did you think at that moment? Because I know I've met a, a fair amount of folks who 9-11 I caused them to I join the service. About it. I think for a long time, until this trip to the Darfur, really, I was maybe just a bit of a follower. 
and a bit of a drifter of just like, if somebody else had an idea, I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. Maybe I'll try that. I, Cause I, I didn't really pursue anything on my own or kind of go after something on my own just to check it out, you know, and, and kind of put myself in the situation. And I was also at that point where, uh, and you sort of alluded to this, I think where a lot of, not just men, people feel this sense of like, what is my purpose of being here? Like what? I'm not, if I weren't here, the world would keep spinning and nothing would change. That's not a good feeling. Like yeah. no one, yeah, my parents would miss me. My brother and sister would miss me, my, you know, some friends, but like, I don't really contribute. My friend, Arthur Brooks, um, and he didn't coin this term, but he says people need to be needed. Mm, yeah. And that for men in particular, but again, it's not just men, but men, totally. we are kind of the utility gender. <laughs> yeah, right, right. It's like, if I'm, if I'm a tool that isn't needed, I don't know what I'm doing here anymore. That doesn't, that's not fun, you know what I mean? And, and also, when I went to the Darfur, I was 23. That's sort of that age for a, a lot of people, for whatever reason, um, whether they went to college or not, because at that time, usually you're kind of coming, coming out of college, and yeah. it's, it's, it's the quarter-life crisis, you know what I mean? It's the first one, where yeah. you're just like, what am I doing? Like, who am I? Why? Uh, you know, all the, the five Ws are going crazy, and you're just like, what's the point of any of this and the existential crises and all that fun stuff. But, uh, well, it's like I, I graduated with whatever degree and now I'm going to go yeah. join Greenpeace for a year or something. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And I didn't gra And that was my, my thing was like, well, all my friends are graduating and like starting their lives, not knowing that they're th probably, they're sitting there thinking like, Oh my God, how cool this guy just took his own path. He didn't go to college like all of us. Like we're all thinking that, you know, grass is always greener and we're, yeah. we're always thinking everybody else is doing so much better than we are. But I understand that, so there's, a, there's something that draws your attention to Darfur, and then there's yes. some initial steps you take that kind of, you hit some, you hit some roadblocks. So talk me yeah. through that. I was out all night with friends, you know, having a good time, and I crashed on my buddy's couch. And I remember, like, coming to, and on his coffee table was this Time magazine. And the article, the, the headline was A Tragedy in Sudan. And it was this picture of this mother, like, holding yeah. this, you know, uh, her little baby and it was just I start flipping through it all the images were really heartbreaking but also um, they just kind of spoke to me and, and locked me in and I, I was reading the article as well but the images first were the things yeah. that just got me that the photographer's name I've never met him but his name's uh, James Nakwe or Jim Nakwe he was a, a war photographer and um, the reason my buddy had that magazine is he was very interested in photography and this was like his idol. So he had that. That's why he oh, had that's that thing. Interesting. I pick it up. I'm like, I'm reading it. I'm reading about how there, there's all these refugee camps on the Chadian border uh, across the, the Darfur, you know, which is the, the Darfur runs along um, the western side of Sudan and it's sort of borders. It doesn't sort of. It borders Chad there. And so the refugee camps are on the Chadian side and they're like overflowing with people and there's not enough and they need, they need help and all. And I was like, wow, okay, they need help. This is what interesting. Was the, what was the conflict for people that- It's a genocide, help. essentially. Was it like a, the group in power, ethnic, trying to ethnic cleanse minorities or was it a civil war? Like what was the- A lot of the- uh, <laughs> Yes <laughs> and. All yes of and. the above. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember reading about the Janjaweed militia, which was this group that was like going village to village, killing all the men. And the women, I mean, in front of these kids and, you know, maiming the kids sometimes, burning the villages to the ground and then like going on to the next one because, yeah, a, a different shade or uh, of skin tone or a different sect of religion or a different religion altogether or any differences. It's just like, you know, I mean, it's a Holocaust of, in a sense. And I just was like, once again, kind of like the 9-11 thing. I was like, how does this, how is this happening? Like, right. What? Um, and this stuff's been happening and is happening all the time in so many places, but it's just, especially back then without social media, you know, and I'm not right. watching the news. It's just, you don't know these things. You just don't think about these things, I guess. Yeah, there was this um, time before we had screens in our pockets that delivered 24-7 right. news. <laughs> it wasn't that long very ago. Very true, very true. And so I just was like, all right, I am going. And, and part of it was maybe the hangover. Part of it was like being that, you felt that, called. Yeah, I felt called. And I'd felt stuck for a long time. And I was like, this is how I get unstuck. Like, you just got to make a change. You got to do something different. So just go. So I'm reading about all the uh, NGOs over there, like Doctors Without Borders and Catholic Relief Services and Child Fund. And, and so I call them all up. 
you know, and I'm like, I'll come volunteer and, you know, I don't want any, I'll, I'll pay my own way, whatever I need to do. And they're all like, well, you don't have a college degree. You don't have any special skills. Like, I don't understand, you don't speak the language. I don't understand how you could help. And I'm like, well, I'm just reading about how the camps, they're not building the camps fast enough. And there's like, I, I'll do anything. It doesn't matter. Like, I just, I want to go help. And they're just like, I'm sorry, it's just not that simple. There's too much red tape. It's, you know, there's a war going on and it's dangerous and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Ugh, okay. I just said, you know what? I'm going to figure this out. So I went to the, you know, the public library and went on the internet and I'm like, how do you get to Chad? You know, what do you need to do? <laughs> you need to get a visa and you need to obviously buy a plane ticket and, but you've got to get approved. So I went down to like the Chadian consulate in, in Los Angeles and, I applied for a visa, like a work visa for like 60 days and I got one. I, I don't even remember what I wrote, but they were like, yep. And it was a lot easier than I thought it would be. And then I went to the AAA in Burbank and, cause that's where we bought plane tickets back then. You know? At least that's where I went, <laughs> I had a AAA card. And I bought a plane ticket to Jemena, which is the capital of Chad. And cause I'd read about the only way to get out to the camps, you gotta fly to the capital, then you gotta go get some circulation papers from the local police and it's this whole thing. And I was like, I'll figure it out. I'll figure it out when I get there. Yeah. When did you tell your parents about oh, this yeah. plane? Before <laughs> so, we get into the deep, you know, you get on Like the a week before I'm <laughs> flying out. I already bought the tickets, it was done. <laughs> well, I went to the thing and, you know, at least back then, it's probably still similar today. Like if you bought it two weeks ahead of time, it was so much cheaper. So I yeah. went there and, and I bought a ticket that was leaving in 14 days. Cause that was the cheapest, that's the best deal I could get. So gave myself two weeks and then, I was actually, my sister was in college uh, at the time at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. So my parents were visiting her and I was like, well, I'll go up and see them and I'll just tell them in person. It'll be a lot better to tell them in person that I'm going to this place. Probably a good call for, you know, a couple of months. I, I remember going up there, sitting down with them and telling them, you know, this is, this is what I'm going to go do. And, you know, my mom was just like, do you have a death wish? You know? And I'm like, right. no, 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 I don't. Like I... I have a life wish. <laughs> you know, I feel right. like I don't, I don't do anything that matters. And I just kind of filled them in on how I felt. That's great. I have a life wish. I yeah. like that. I mean, that's what it felt <laughs> like. I, I, I was like, I, I, I want to, I want to matter, you know? And I mean, they were supportive. They were worried for sure, you know? Um, but they both were like, you know, I mean, this, that's great that you're doing this, you know? course we're going to worry about you but you know let us know how we can stay in contact and I'm like I don't know you know it wasn't right. we didn't really I mean it's I'm, not like you've got a s satellite phone in your pocket no. how long were you there I was there for uh I don't know exactly I know the visa was 60 days but I think I was there a little less than that but it was okay. a good if several weeks you know I flew out land in the capital I get to the air just the airport alone was like chaos I mean it was uh, yeah, I can only imagine. Yeah, and, and it, not just chaos, but just culture shock. I, I guess I was sort of prepared, but until you're around it, and it's just, it's beyond just seeing people dress differently. It's the, you know, now you're hearing the different languages, things smell different, everything is different, you know, food and people. It's just, it's very yeah. different. So did you have like yeah. a god? Like did, no, did you didn't I have no any contact? You had no, no like nothing. point of contact. You you arrive in Chad in the airport. You don't know where you're going to go, where you're going to stay, who you're going to talk to. I, I lied, honestly. I, I found where the the UNHCR, United Nations High Commission for Refugees, they had their planes that would fly across the Sahara out to uh, Abeche was the name of this town that was near the camps, right? But it's like a 20 hour drive and a you know couple hour flight or whatever. So I found out where those planes were taken off from and I went to this, there was this little chatty man with like a clipboard, like, you know, with the manifest. And of course I'm not on it, but I talked to him and I was like, Hey, you know, I'm supposed to be on yeah, this flight. Exactly. That's exactly what I said, you know? And he's like, <laughs> what organization are you with? And I, I don't remember which one I said, but I said one of them. And I had, all I had is like this one, like shoulder, like, a, you know, this, the Indiana Jones satchel, you know, we'll circle back to that. <laughs> and, uh, but it had like toothbrush, malaria pills, you know, a couple power bars, change of boxer shorts, socks, another shirt, that's about it. And I was like, this is like, I, I, I got robbed, you know, in Paris on my way here. And so they took all my documentation and all my other clothes and everything. I never had any of that, that's all I brought. But I don't like, but I, I mean, I promise you, like what else would I be doing here? And yeah. this is my American passport and I'm, I'm here to volunteer, you know? And so he was like, okay, and he just believed it. And it was funny, cause there was this other section, they had like these velvet ropes, almost like, 
we were waiting outside the club. You know what I mean? <laughs> it wasn't like the airport, like the straps. Come it was to like, the refugee camp. Yeah, it was the velvet ropes. And on the other side, there's a ton of journalists with like cameras hanging off their pelican cases full of gear. And he's not letting them go because he's just like, well, they're here to just capture this. And he assumed that I was supposed to be there. And there was only one seat open on the plane. Like there was, wow. all the other seats were taken and he let me on, he let me go. So I went and sat, I got on the plane, you know, fly across the desert. It's crazy. I just remember looking down out of the plane and there's like herds of camels and then like an old like, ru you know, Russian tank just in the middle of the desert, just sitting there, just really bizarre. And you could see this stuff because we weren't flying that high. You could see all this stuff out the windows. And then we like, land, everybody goes and meets their contact, you know. I don't have one, so I walk <laughs> into, uh, I walk into the Catholic Relief Services tent and just kinda, kinda said, yeah, I'm here to volunteer. They're like, who are you meeting? And I was like, I'm not sure, but I'm here, you know, so. It's a lot harder to be like, yeah. Show me your college degree. It's like, yeah, no, yeah. they don't, it's the, right. and it's local, it's local people that are like working on all, all the administrative jobs, right? Yeah. And including, including security and they're heavily armed, you know? And I was just like, but I mean, obviously this is all I have. I, I'm supposed to be here. They put me in this office said, wait here. And uh, a few minutes later, this French Canadian guy, big dude, like barrels through the door and he's like interrogating me like, who are you with? What are you doing right. here? Because who like, knows? Yeah, exactly. So there's not really, they don't really speak English, like very, right. very little English. So he's like yelling at me in French first. And I'm like, I don't speak, I speak English. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm American. <laughs> and after we talked for like half an hour and he realized, he, I mean, he believed me when I told him, I mean, I was telling him the truth, but yeah. then I was yeah, like, yeah. this is why I'm here. This is, I, I just want to help. I fibbed to get physically to this location, yeah. but my, my motivations are Yeah, I promise. I just want to help whatever. And he ended up helping me. They had to fly. <laughs> they had to fly back with the next plane leaving to the capital to get those papers. I was telling you about like the circulation papers from the local police. But they okay. they took me to the station, got them, and then flew back hmm. like, the next day. Wow. And they put me to work. And so I I was out there in the camps. You know, I stayed in the camps. You know, with the people. And every day it was like I mean, it was very simple. I was assisting in the medical centers, have, you know, helping pass out food rations, helping build the tents playing soccer with the kids every day. I was the only kind of young guy that wasn't like a doctor, you know, that was white, to be completely honest. And when they found out I was from America, they all wanted to hear about America. You know, they were just like enamored by it, understandably, because it, it is it is a beacon of hope to a lot of people, you know, and I know we're not perfect, I'm not saying that, but yeah. if you go to much of the world, especially the developing world, they're, they're like, when they find out you're from America, like, oh my gosh, because it's pop culture and movies and all that stuff too, you know what I mean? But oh, yeah. the American That's dream is a very real thing. I think we're still the number one destination for immigrants that want to build a better life, is to come to America. Right, Which right. I wish more Americans could see through that lens. Yeah. <laughs> How did experiencing that change the way you saw the country. I, I gained my patriotism there, <laughs> honestly. You talked about, in, in one of the interviews um, I watched, the joy that you saw on the face of kids, many of whose faces were maimed. Yeah, for these kids that, like literally, they have one soccer ball for this entire, you know, camp. And they're smiling and laughing and you know, they have absolutely nothing they, they get to eat once a day, maybe. And they're living in the desert, in the tent on the ground. And yeah, that was really inspiring to me. And just like, I remember thinking to myself, like, this is, this is who I want to fight for. You know, I want to fight for those that can't fight for themselves, no matter what I'm doing. And that can look like various things. But so then towards the end of the trip, I got malaria. And I was taking the medicine. I was doing everything I was supposed to do. Take my, took my doxy, but it didn't, didn't work. This family put me up in their, they had their you know, little mud hut compound and they had an extra room. Put me in this room on a cot. This is just a local, local family. Yeah, local family. They were giving me medicine. I don't know what it was. I was just taking these pills. I, <laughs> I, I just trusted them. And it was, I mean, it was good. It helped my symptoms. But they put next to the bed, they put this radio. So I started flipping through the stations and the only channel that came through was the BBC uh, radio news. And so I'm listening to like play by play of the second battle of Fallujah, which I believe occurred in November of uh, 2004, because that's when I was there. I think so. Was this November. was the big offensive in Iraq, yeah, right? Exactly. And 
I'm like, wow, like these people are there, these young kids, you know, most of them younger than me, I was 23, are going over there and doing this. And, and I was just like, you know what, when I come back to the States, I'm just gonna join the Army. Like, I'm just gonna, or I was gonna join the Marine Corps, is what I initially thought, because I'm listening to the Marines. Yeah. So I come back to the States, and this is what I'm gonna do. I go to the Marine Corps recruiting office. It was like, I did not have a good experience. And I was like, I just mm. felt like, yeah, I'm like, ah, this doesn't feel right. I don't know. So I back out of it. I remember going to uh, go get my oil changed. And I'm like sitting there in the waiting room and I look over and there's another magazine there. <laughs> These magazines, These man. Magazines. And I, I think it was also time. I can't remember exactly, but <laughs> I pick it up and it's like this special forces soldier fast roping out of a helicopter. And it, I'm reading, I'm gonna start reading this article and it's about this new 18 x-ray program. And they'd had some of the first people graduate it. It, you know, it took two years from when they joined to when they earned their Green Beret. But they came in off the street and they went to, you go to, if you tested high enough on all this stuff and the psyche value had to pass and flight physical and it was just all these things, right? You'd go to basic training, airborne school, and then special forces selection. And if you make it through selection, which is tough, then you start your about year and a half long training to become a, a Green Beret, to be, to be a special forces soldier. In a, at the most basic level, what, act, what is the special forces? Is it a division of the army? It is. And then what does the Green Beret, we hear this term like Green Beret, but what does that actually mean? So the Green, the green Beret, that's what we wear on our head. It's sort of the slang term for a special forces soldier. A special forces gets thrown around a lot, but yeah. in reality, the only special forces are army. It is the army special operations, you know, one of the special operations units. The Rangers are also a special operations unit. The SEALs are sort of the Navy special operations. You know, there's Marine, uh, MARSOC it's called now. Uh, used to be Marine Recon. Um, there's Air Force uh, Pararescue and Combat Controllers. There's all these special operations units, but the only special forces are Army. And, um, and what makes them special? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so they, they, they started uh, in the early 60s, and so the first war was Vietnam that these guys were going to. Uh, and what they do, every mission is conducted by, with, and through indigenous forces, indigenous people, really. So you're, you're going, if you're going to Iraq and Afghanistan in the current war, you are training, fighting alongside, and, and even living with uh, Iraqi and Afghan forces, uh, which was very unique. And it eventually evolved into what most units were doing when it turned into a train advised assist mission later in the war. But in Vietnam, like these guys would be fully embedded uh, with these, uh, you know, these, these, these Vietnamese folks trying to, you know, fight the Viet Cong. And sometimes it would just be, uh, you know, a, a couple of guys and, and hundreds of Vietnamese soldiers, and they're training them and like living with them and then going on missions with them. Wow. You know, there's one story I was just reading about recently, uh, the most recent Medal of Honor recipient, his name is Paris Davis. He was in, in Vietnam. Uh, he was, a, he was a, a black special forces soldier, one of the first. And I believe in his mission, it was four of them and they were leading, you know, platoons of Vietnamese in this in this battle and I can only imagine what that's like what that was like it's very different than even now but but still today what carries over is that foreign internal defense you know idea on un, un, unconventional warfare which means a lot of different things but foreign internal defense is that idea that I was talking about where you are you are assimilating to the culture you know you're, you're you you learn you learn language and then you train in tactics that make sense for that part of the world, the resources or lack of resources they have, oftentimes a lack of education and training, and you do what you can, but you're trying to build uh, a military that's sustainable on their own. And it's very difficult, obviously, and, right. you know, and oftentimes it fails. And, uh, but that's what, the, that's what the intent is. There's a, there's a slogan for the Special Forces, which I never heard before. Yeah. So tell me about that. It's De Oppressa Liber. It means to free the oppressed. I remember reading that in the magazine article, and of all the things I read, which were all appealing and interesting, that would, like really spoke to me because I was like, "Oh, to free the oppressed, like that, that is exactly what I want to do. That's what I want to be a part of." When you got through and you got your green ber beret and you're deployed, did did you feel like you were living that slogan in the work you did? I'd say, by and large, yes, or at least trying to. But it's like anything, you know. It's there's an ideal and then there's reality. Yeah, once you get into it, you're like, oh, this isn't as cool as I thought it would be, or this isn't. <laughs> but then there's other things that I was like, 
I got more out of this than I, I, I didn't even think about this part of it, you know, and I got, and, and what, more than anything, what it has set me up for the rest of my life and like a belief in myself and the concept of everything that you do is about the man on your left and right. It's not about you. You know, it's about keeping them safe and, and that sort of thinking and having those leaders in your life and mentors and people that you are best friends with, but you also look up to at the same time. That's really unique and really special. And I never would have went and tried to play football and do all these other things I'm doing without that. That was that, first of all, that trip to Darfur, which spawned it, just taking that step and going to do that. But going through that, that two years of training and then getting the opportunity to, you know, to go uh, overseas a number of times and to deploy, to go to war three times and, um, and fight alongside these people um, that didn't all wear American flags on their shoulders. There's so much that I got out of that that I wasn't expecting. So yes, while, while there was like things that have that disappointed me like anything in life, there were so many things that I'd never thought of um, that I'm very proud to have been a part of and, um, and the efforts in, in, in what we were doing, you know, whether you call them a failure or whatever, I don't think any of them were in vain. Um, and I always try to stress that to people that feel that way, that's, that went over there and served. They're like, oh, you know, everyone says we did it for nothing. And I feel like sometimes that's true. And I'm like, yeah, but what was your intent? Like, what were you trying to do? You know, the team that goes out there and, and, and loses the Super Bowl, was it, was it, should they have just not played? <laughs> you know what right. I mean? I mean, is there any one story of a, of a local that you met, that you developed a relationship with that you'd want to share? Something, a person that just stays with you in your thoughts? The one that stays the most in my thoughts is from before the military. It's from the Darfur, honestly. Okay. Um, it's this little kid named Mustafa who physically he, he, he was maimed in some, in, in some ways. And, but he always had a smile on his face and he would never, he like never touched the soccer ball. Like when they played soccer, he would just, it, he, ne he always tried, he never got a foot on it. You know what I mean? Cause he's too slow and he couldn't get yeah, it. Yeah. But he just always was positive and like just trying and with a smile on it. I don't know, like that kid. And he was just very engaged for, I mean, I don't know. He was three, five, maybe he was little, you know? Oh my gosh. That, that kid, I remember writing about him in my journal and that, that kid definitely sticks out. There, there are absolutely Iraqi and, and Afghan soldiers that, that inspired me and were very, I think specifically in Iraq, uh, because some of the people we were working with were hi highly untrained, but they had this vision of like, I want to serve my country. I want to be in the Iraqi special forces, you know, and like, put in the work. Yeah, that was, I mean, those are the guys that inspired me the most. Like, there was one gentleman that was quite a bit older <laughs> and he was really short little guy. <laughs> but man, he just like, he went so hard. And when he graduated, when these guys graduated the course, we gave him these certificates, you know, and it was like pretty special for them. And he got really emotional. He was so proud, you know? So like that, I was like, that's cool. You know, we don't get into certain things very much on this show. But one thing I, I, I feel like I, I have to ask you is the exit from Afghanistan was um, very difficult to see from, yeah. from, from, from abroad, from, from a position of ignorance, which is the best I could describe myself, which is here we are over there for 20 plus years. And the thing that was so, sh that I hadn't really thought about was that means there's an entire generation of young people for whom from birth until they're now in their 20s, U.S. occupation and, and to, to the extent we were keeping more peace than would come next, like they, they acclimated to that, you know, and, and how, you know, how do you think about what's happened? And it's not, I'm not really asking you to necessarily judge the decision per se, but is there anything you'd want to share about just looking back on our relationship with that effort and it's come to kind of an end in a way that I know a lot of folks are like, this was a terrible way to end. Yeah. <laughs> Even if we shouldn't have been there, like, did we have to end it this way? Right. I mean, how do you think about that? And how does it, does it change the, your relationship with the work you did? No, it doesn't change your relationship with the work I did. I, I, like I said earlier, I, I genuinely believe it's all about the intent and the effort. You can't get too stuck on the result. 
That being said, it's a terrible result, and none of us that I know of, that I served with anyway, wanted it to end that way. I know that a lot of us in the special operations community, not just special forces, uh, across the board in different branches, the sort of leading reason that we sign up for this and, and volunteer to go try and be in those units is because we want to be over there helping, serving, you know, doing something, trying. And uh, there were so many, uh, at least in my community, in the Special Forces community, so many Green Berets that were like, can we just leave a few of our teams over there? Like the ODAs, 12-man teams, you know, sprinkled about the country. Because, no, we're not really gaining ground right now, but we're not losing ground. And we just don't want to see this thing fall apart. I just remember, like, the people that we were around, we're very grateful, most of them, for us being there and the ones we were training and working with that were trying to install democracy, give women rights, you know, and, and voting and sort of evolve into the 21st century. <laughs> That's what frustrated me and frustrates me and makes me feel sad because I feel like even if it was just a small number, I could be wrong, of course, of, of special operations that were left there, maybe it wouldn't have turned over like that and ended as quick as it did. And I don't think there's any easy answers to any of this stuff. This is really complicated stuff. There's a lot of oppression that exists in the world in a lot of places. And um, of course, the United States enters into conflicts that there is a, uh, there is something to gain, you know. There's a, yeah, some interest. There is an interest, yeah. And so like, I'm not denying that in any way, but I mean, I wish we went more places <laughs> and tried to help. And it's like, well, people will be like, well, you're just, in, you know, you're trying to just force yourselves on, onto these other uh, cultures and, you know, get them. But it's like, yeah, but a lot of those people want us to. It's not like all those people there don't want us there. There's a lot of people there that do want to, to, to change and believe that uh, a capitalist society and, a, you know, democracy are the least bad <laughs> of all the bad ideas, as they say in our I would certainly agree with that. <laughs> you know? I think, uh, yeah, it's really I, difficult and complicated. I probably lean towards the, the skeptic in terms of, you know, do we have the knowledge? Maybe we should try to get our own house in order. Do we have the knowledge to go over and spread democracy? I, you know, like, can we, I mean, is that dumb. a thing we can do? It's really hard, it's really complicated, but, um, I can see all the sides of it for sure. And my own views continue to evolve over time. I was in New York in 9-11. It was like, this is something that, the, the planet has gotten a lot smaller in the 21st century and we can't pretend that we can just be isolated and that nothing will happen. I wanna take us back. So when do you come back to the States and when do you try out at we're here in Austin. You are a, you are you are a legend here. Ah. <laughs> tell me, tell our viewers why. For those those watching that don't know what you did here in Austin and how that happened, tell the story. All right. So, uh, I'm actually on that deployment in Iraq, and I'm getting towards the end of it, and it's the fall, and it's football season, and I was getting pretty worn out with sort of as we all do, we, you're getting run down after, you know, nine months over there and I'm, I'm watching football any chance I get. It's like an escape for me, right? Yeah. And it was always my favorite sport. So it's football season. So it's football season. So it's like Monday night football is on at 5 a.m. In, in, in Iraq. So I'm getting back from a mission and I'm staying up to watch the Monday night football game, right? And it's just <laughs> like, then there's no football Tuesday, Wednesday, there's the Thursday night game. There's Friday night college game, and then there's Saturday college football, Sunday college football. Any chance I get, if I have any free time, I'm watching football, and I'm sort of fantasizing about this um, long lost dream of playing pro sports, playing collegiate sports anyway. Yeah. But I also have this regret of never playing football. Like at all. At all in my life, and I'm like, man, at this time I was 28. So you're, I mean, you're from a college perspective, you're like a geezer. Yeah. You're like the, you know, from 
if you come into school, it's like, who's the old guy? Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't get here until I was 29 because I still had a year left on my contract. And I, that was the other thing. I had a year left on my contract, so I had the opportunity to re-enlist. At that time, I was, in, I was in Iraq. This was in 08. The war is sort of winding down there. And so I'm like, mm, I just don't know if I think it's maybe time and feel like a, an interest in going to college, finally. Was your interest in college just football? Or did you have something else you were thinking <laughs> is going to be valuable out of this? Uh, Honestly, it wasn't experience. just football. <laughs> but if I wasn't going to, it was f largely motivated by trying to play college football. It really was. It really was. I didn't know what I was going to study exactly. OK, but, but why no, Texas? So, so Texas, because Austin was a big part of it. I wanted to go somewhere new. And the Longhorns at the time, and this was like Colt McCoy and Jordan Shipley and you know, that that team was uh, very good and competed for the national championship the, the following year yeah. before I got here. I, I remember thinking, maybe I'll just go to a small college and try out. And my buddy Brad, who unfortunately passed away in 2012, he was, when I was talking earlier about those guys that are your mentors that are like, they'll give you, but at the same time, they always got your back and they lead by example. They'll take the dirtiest job if we got to clean something up. It's yeah. just the guy you sit around the campfire after, yeah. after at, at night up on the rooftop and just talk about life. You know, he had married a single mother who had a child with uh, disabilities and was just like a stand-up human, you know. That dad saved America. And Brad uh, uh, was like, no, man, you're not going to a small school. You're going to go to a big school. You have to. You're Green Bray. Like, you can't. <laughs> I know, he's like, I know how you are, Nate. I know what you're, I know what you're really about. Like, it, it's going to bother you. And I was like, okay, fair enough. So I just, I kind of picked Texas because of that. You know, Mac uh, had been on a USO trip like the year prior. And Mac, who's Mac? Mac Brown, sorry. Okay. Head coach of the Longhorns, now the University of North Carolina Tar Heels. I gotcha. Yeah. It's his second time back there. But he was a Texas coach for about 14, 15 years. You know, won the national championship with Vince Young, just a, you know, a legend. And I heard about when he'd gone on his USO tour, uh, when they stop at these bases, like he was the guy that was like, I'm gonna shake every hand. I'm not letting this helicopter take off until everybody that wants to, you know. And I was like, cool, he won't cut me. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, you know. Yeah, yeah, so you're surveying your yeah, odds. Exactly. I got, yeah. a, I got a friendly. We call it war gaming. You know? <laughs> um, so I was doing that and, but yeah, and so I started training in Iraq. I was like, I kind of just made the decision. All right, I'm just gonna, I started taking online classes because my high school grades sucked. Started taking online classes at Central Texas College. Hmm. I'm gonna get my grades straight. I'm gonna transfer in as a sophomore academically and I'm gonna try out for the football team. And so I was like trying to teach myself how to backpedal and like run routes in the sand out there in, in, in Iraq. And I'm like. Did you have any other guys with you that could, I mean, no. play football and, or um, something or like? And they did, but I didn't really, I sort of embarrassed that I was doing this. So I didn't really, Brad was about the only one that knew, uh, at least initially. Eventually I told the rest of the team, but. So I was kind of secretly sneaking off around some HESCO barriers, you know, and doing it. There'd, there'd be like an Iraqi guard in the tower of our little base, you know, and he'd be kind of like turning around watching me. And I'm like, no, turn around, turn around, don't watch me, it's embarrassing. <laughs> but yeah, I got in really good, well, reasonably good football shape, um, put on a little bit of weight. I was tiny. I mean, I weighed 165 pounds when I was in the Army. And I got out, came down to Austin, stayed in the... Uh, I don't know if it's still there. There was a there was a Motel Six off of 35 over near the baseball field, kind of. Yeah, and I started going to classes and I started going to tryouts and uh, and made the, made the team. So you walked on. So what does that mean? Uh, it, it basically means I, I didn't have a scholarship. I mean, of course, <laughs> I wasn't recruited. I never played. I, I remember going down to one of their practices in the off season, I, I'd gotten back from Iraq. I had a few more months in the military, but I went down to visit Austin. And first of all, I get, I get picked up from the airport. Uh, you, you, do you ride in fatigues? You're just like, I'm just going straight. I wasn't in fatigues. Uh, <laughs> when I went to practice, I did have my dress blues on because I also, that day I also met with admissions uh, at the, you know, I was like, all right. Cause I wasn't in yet. Yeah. Okay. And I was like, I'm going to, I'm going to go meet the, the Dean of the college of education where kinesiology is a part of, I'm going to go to the admissions office. I'm gonna be dressed in my stuff, you know, and this will give me every little advantage I can get to get in, because that stuff right. does matter. It's just like writing an essay, you know, yeah. it matters. Yeah, it's not, and it's not a sure thing you're gonna get in. No, to no, UT. it's a tough school, it's a tough school. Yeah. And so 
I, but I went to practice, you know, oh, oh I was gonna say, I got picked up from the airport and this cab driver. <laughs> and he was like, have you ever been to Austin before? And I was like, I've been here once passing through, but I don't really remember. We went out, you know, on 6th Street. And I, I didn't really spend much time here. I was just here for a night. And he's like, oh, you're gonna love it. The best part about Austin is all the cowboys smoke pot and all the hippies carry guns. And I was like, <laughs> all right, all right, that's, that's cool. Still, that's you know? still true. Yeah, I'm like, it's a good mix. Everybody sort of gets along and kind of has their yeah. different thing for the most part. You know? It's a deep blue city and a deep red state, which means it ends up being pretty purple swirly. Yeah, oh, I like that. <laughs> so I go, to, I go to practice, I meet this head strength coach, uh, Jeff Madden, Mad Dog was his nickname. Everybody called him Mad Dog. He had this big chain that said Mad Dog. On it. <laughs> and I talked to him, I asked him, like, hey, when are the spring tryouts and all the stuff? And he was just like, What'd you do in the service? And I said, I, you know, I was in the special forces. And he's like, oh, right on. And so they were like, do you have a film from <laughs> high school or references from your coaches, like a letter? Right. And I'm like, it was so long ago, you know. Again, I don't. Hmm. I, 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 yeah, <laughs> I was like, I don't have any of that stuff. They were uh, stolen in Paris. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was, I was robbed in Paris. So I, uh, I didn't have that stuff, and they were like, eh, you know what? Don't worry about it. You know, just, just show up. You know, if you get into school, obviously, if you get in. So I had one more trip to, uh, to Israel. That's when I went to Israel, and we trained with the Israeli Special Forces over there and come back. I was actually in Israel when I think my mom got the letter. So she sent me an email saying, hey, you got into Texas. You know, congratulations. And, Your parents must have. Yeah. They were like, finally, <laughs> 10 years later, <laughs> he's ready. But I'm sure they were proud of what, the work you had done in the service and film, they were. and they didn't feel like you, you weren't directionless at this point. I no. mean, you, you were. And that started. Is, sharp. I remember I, I could see a visible change on uh, in my, my, my mom, especially in her body language and pride. A little Not more peacocking. Was, yes. When I, I just, <laughs> when she, no, no, this was just when she showed up to, she came, they came to my basic training graduation. You know, and all of a sudden they see me in the uniform for the first time, and I probably had a little better posture, and I was fit, you know, and I just remember, I think that was the moment, the first yeah. moment she was like, all right, this was the move. This is, he's right where he needs to be. This was the path that make, it makes sense now. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So to answer the longest winded question or answer ever to your question about walking on. So, you know, when you're a walk on, yeah, you're not on scholarship. You basically just have to go to tryouts if they let you come to tryouts. They don't let every, anybody, just anybody try yeah, out. Because any Yahoo could just sort of yeah. rush the field and be like, yeah. let me try. And it was just, there's just, there'd probably be a, hundreds of people that would show yeah. up for this. And it's like, how do you evaluate that? So they make the, understandably, especially at a school like Texas, they make the process challenging to even get a tryout, you know. Basically, we started spring conditioning, which was pretty intense. Um, honestly, it was, I don't want to say it was nothing, but it was a lot easier for me because I just came out of the army and special yeah. forces and we're like running, we're, you know, we're running all the time and it's like constant training. So I was in really good shape and, um, and I had good endurance and it was a lot of, that stuff was endurance. So you're, you're the geezer out running all the like 19 oh, yeah. year olds. We did the first day of practice, I guess. And it wasn't practice in pads. It was like first day of conditioning. Yeah. We get out there and mad dog says, all right. Uh, they had just lost the national championship game a couple weeks prior to uh, to Alabama, and he goes, "All right, all the the DBs, what receivers, quarterbacks, running backs, tight ends, you know, six laps around the field, offense and defensive line, four laps around the field, go." And they all start jogging. I start sprinting. I'm just like, <laughs> "They're not cutting me, no matter what." <laughs> and I hear these. They don't know who I am. These guys. I mean, they. They, I got like freaking ankle brace on my foot. I'd, I'd, I'd uh, rolled my ankle on a skydive, a halo jump, um, a skydiving jump. Oh, like, so you're injured. Yes, in December. <laughs> this is January and it still hurt, but it was not, it was getting better. But I'm like, I'm not missing this. And so I uh, had the sprained, sprained ankle, this dorky looking brace on. Like I look like an idiot, you know what I mean? I'm already just a little past my prime. And I'm like lapping guys, you know, because they're not trying, they're jogging, they're just warming up. Right. And they're giving me crap for, you know, trying to be a hero out there. And I'm just like, in my mind, like, I'm just trying to make the team, man. Like, I'm not trying to show you up. Yeah. I mean, maybe a little bit, but just because I want to make, I just want to make the team right now. And we get back and like Mad Dog, he's like, come here, sir, come here, son, or sir, or whatever he said. And I came up and, and he's like, you know, this guy just whooped y'all's ass and he's 29 years old, you know. And, <laughs> and you know. That, that really ingratiated Yeah, you with I was the like, team. great, thanks. Um, <laughs> after that, after day one, I was like, all right, 
Like, just keep doing that. They can't cut you. Just give them a reason. Don't give them a reason to cut you. That's all you yeah. need to do. You don't need to do yeah. anything spectacular. Just don't give them a reason to cut you. So what happens? So I make it. Eventually, after a few weeks, I show up to conditioning or whatever, and there's like, in my, in a, I have a locker now, and there's like a Texas, you know, strength training equipment, not equipment, but like clothing hanging. It yeah. says like Texas strength conditioning, like hanging in my locker and you know, I got a pair of cleats and like all that. I'm like, wow, all yeah. right. It's like the first ritual thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you I was like, these this like is totems. official. It's official. I'm a part of this, I got, I got a locker. And then spring practices start. And so it's like, now we're putting on pads and you know, I have no idea what I'm about to get into. Don't even really know what position I'm gonna play. I uh, didn't even know how to put pads on. So <laughs> I remember like the first day I'm like, I'm kind of sitting there in my locker just watching everybody else so I don't do something that looks stupid, you know? And they're like, I watch them, that, okay, they put the jersey on the pads first because it's really tight. So you put that on the pads first and then you put your pads on. But I wouldn't have known that. I would have just put the pads on and then tried to do this jersey, you know, then it would have been awkward and not, I, I would have been, they would have been like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. This guy's clearly never played football. Smart choice. Yeah, so I waited and I watched and... Situational awareness. Yeah, and then I did it and I put the stuff on. I go out there, it's like first day of practice, I remember um, for the walk-ons, for the, you know, the, the non-scholarship guys, you're sort of wherever they need you. And typically that means you're getting run over in whatever the drill is. Yeah. It's because they're preparing the guys that will actually play on Saturday for the games. And so I, I'm out there and they're doing... Uh, they're practicing uh, kickoff returns. So they've got the returner back there and then this wedge of two or three guys, big guys, that are blocking for him, you know, and they're sh sending us running down the field like we're going to go make a tackle. And the whole point of it is to just get destroyed by the people <laughs> that are the wedge. And you're trying to bust the wedge, as they call yeah. it, the wedge buster. And, you know, at this point, I put on a little bit of weight. I was probably 175 pounds at this point, but I'm, you know, and I'm not yeah. very fast and I'm not, I don't know what I'm doing. And, but I'm just like, I'm going 100 miles an hour no matter what. So like just run down there and just get destroyed, you know, like yard sale. Like, you know, I'm pretty sure a cleat flew off. Like one of those things. I just get <laughs> upended, um, get up, you know, go back over, do it again, do it again. And I've eventually I've got guys kind of like in the, if you've ever seen Rudy, the movie. Yeah. And at that point, they're just like, dude, stop. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're going to get hurt and you're making us all look bad, you know. And I'm just like, I'm just trying to, I don't know what I'm doing, but I, this is the only way I know how to go. And I want to try to. <laughs> I've only got one speed. And I only got one speed. It's not yeah. very fast, but it's, it's, <laughs> this is the speed. I, I, I just wanted to find a way on the field. I didn't really care what position. I, I, I quickly realized that I was not going to play wide receiver and I probably wasn't going to play defensive back. So you're like, cause you're, you're not fast enough for I'm wide just not receiver. not fast enough. I'm not good. Yeah. And I don't know the game. And yeah. these guys are, it's Texas, you know, and it's not just Texas. A lot of universities have the talent pool, but these, they're so yeah, good. Texas has got a big talent pool. Yeah. Their it's, third and fourth string guys were like freaking high school, all American. How do you decide? Cause I, cause you decide you want to be a long snapper. I, it was, I did not decide I want to be a long snapper. It was a oh, lack of options. Okay. So it was a, what is the thing? I'm not going to be a lineman. I'm not going to be a wide receiver. I'm yeah. not going to be the quarterback. Nope. So this is the, oh, I think I can do this part and I've, fit in and be a contributor. My, my last couple months in the, in the military, if I get back from Israel, I'm training in Colorado Springs. I was stationed in Colorado Springs at the time. And the, National Strength and Conditioning Association, NSCA, is headquartered there, as well as like the Olympic Training Center. And so we had the opportunity to go work out in those facilities. And there was one of the strength coaches there, used to be a collegiate strength coach at, like he was at Baylor and USC and Missouri and like all these big schools. And he was like, man, you should, you should long snap. And I was like, what is long snapping? You know, and he's like, it's a guy that's not, you know, hikes it for punts, field goals, and extra points. I'm like, no. That's dumb. Nobody cares about that. That's not. Nobody's that, cheering that yeah, guy. There's, that's the least sexy position ever. Like, come on. So now I'm there at Texas, and I'm like, hmm. Yeah, Maybe I should start seed, long snapping. The you know seed was I mean? planted. The seed was planted because it was just, uh, he knew. He's like watching me train, and he's like, this is the best. You're, you're doing the best that you can, but it ain't going to get you on the field at those positions. You're going to have to find something else out. And. And so I was like, all right, well, the starting long snapper is a senior. The backup's a senior. I've never long snapped before, but I never played football before, and I made the team, you know. <laughs> and we're like, we're into the season now. I got, to, I got to run down on kickoff coverage 
on the Veterans Day game because we were blowing out Texas Tech and some of the players and assistant coaches were like, hey, put, put Boyer in. Like, come on, it's Veterans Day. We're up, we're up by, you know, 25 or whatever. <laughs> he can't and, screw us. Yeah, it's over. <laughs> there's, there's two minutes left. Well, I mean, and maybe he can, but we'll just blame him. It's fine, you know. So, yes, yeah, so they put me in. I run down there. I'm nowhere near the tackle, but I, like, threw a guy down. You know, I remember he was a big tight end, and he kind of lost his balance, and I just, I, I was, like, literally 30 yards from the play. Yeah. But the sideline was all watching me, and they were like, yeah, they went crazy, and the Jumbotron, ha- you know, had me coming yeah, off the yeah. field. And I was like, man, I got to find a way to play some meaningful snaps. I got to find a way on the field. So, so I just decided I was going to be the long snapper, and I started practicing it. I was, you know, I asked the... The, the snappers that were on the team, like, how do you grip it? You know, show me how to grip it. And then I'd kind of watch them at practice. And then I would go to the gym at different hours when no one was in there. And I would like practice snapping it into a wall. And I remember the strength coach would sit up in his office in the perch, you know, and he'd watch me and just kind of be like, you know, keep, keep working at it. You, know, you got a long way to go. YouTube made a video about this um, that has 27 million views. And it's obvious why they did it, because you used YouTube yeah. to help you learn. I mean, that was the, that was the number one tool, uh, honestly. I, I, uh, <laughs> You're like, I got on this team. Yeah. How do I long snap? Yeah. You're like a Gen Zer. Like, I'm just going to go on YouTube and teach myself. <laughs> Not a Gen Zer. <laughs> <laughs> I remember Googling football drills and all this stuff when I was in Iraq initially. Iraq initially. And now, when I'm deciding to long snap, I actually had re-enlisted into the Texas National Guard, and I was about to go overseas. So I, I, when I was in college... So you went, you got, you got into school, you're back. Yeah, yeah. But you re-enlist. Yeah, I re-enlisted in 2011. Why? Uh, I mean, you'd served, you'd been in these, yeah. you, you know... I missed it. A lot of it was I missed it. So that summer, I'm going overseas. I ended up going, I went back to Afghanistan two times while I was in college at Texas. So I go overseas, I bring a couple of footballs with me. Before I leave, I go to Mac Brown's office. I said, Coach, I'm going, uh, I'm going overseas for just a couple of, you know, three months or so. I'm going to bring a couple of footballs with me. I'm going to practice long snapping every day. When I come back, I would just love the opportunity to try out for the position. And he was like, well, have you ever long snapped before? And I was like, Coach, I never played football before I got here. And he was like, what? <laughs> like, I didn't know that. <laughs> he's like, All right. He's like, yeah, sure. Why not? You know, of course, we'll, we'll let you try out for it. And, you know, of course, in his mind, he's like, you're not going to figure this thing out in a few months. But I snapped 100 balls a day when I was over there. I built targets out of plywood. And any free time I had, I was training, working out, or long snapping. And people and, can say what they want about that position. But you're upside down, and you are about to get rushed by a wall of massive people. And you and in are, my case, you are chucking over. that ball upside down through your legs and it has to like, and it's a perfect spiral at a, at a really, to, so it can be grabbed and kicked. I mean, it's yeah, like, exactly. it's, I, cause I was watching the videos and, and it's like, this is really hard. Like there's no way, <laughs> if somebody put a gun to my head, there's no chance I could pull it off. You, uh, uh, if you practice for a long time, you never know. You right. never know. I mean, it helps. Right. Sure. But, I think playing baseball helps because I had a decent arm, not a great arm, but a decent arm. I used to pitch, so you can, you know, you learn how to spin the ball a little bit. But you're all doing it upside down. Like, I know, I mean, it's weird. No, it's, it's super weird. It's a lot of weird stuff to pull off. It's so. definitely, you know what I did? I, I learned how to do it just like I learned how to shoot a pistol. And it was like one piece at, the, at a time. When we were trained in, uh, in, you know, some of the marksmanship courses, we drew the pistol out of our holster to here for days before they let us put a brown in the chamber and even, you know, squeeze one off down range. So it was like, we're just practicing that one little motion. So I am laying on my back, just spinning it, you know, getting the grip, spinning it until I'm getting tight spirals and, and just like all wrists, like getting the, the getting that yeah. uh, perfected as best, as best as I could. And then I'm working on um, stance and different, I'm lifting weights out of that stance. So I'm doing like Olympic lifts, like cleans and things that make sense for that explosive movement of launching that thing through your legs. Cause it is like a violent motion. I mean, it's yeah. not, you're not hitting anybody, but it is. And you, and that's how you get the, the velocity. And so then it's like, you get the spiral, you get started with the grip and the stance, and then you're working on the explosion out of that stance and the, the release and making sure it's a tight spiral and the aim point. And you're focusing on a little tiny 
piece of cloth on the uniform, you know, aim small, miss small, just like when we were learning to shoot. Are there um, Afghans looking around like, what the hell is this guy doing, like, in oh, Iraq? Yeah. <laughs> I remember being out there, because I, I would, so the base we were on at Camp Moorhead was, we had the Afghan side of the base, and that's where the big yeah. soccer field was. So I, one of the things I like to do is I, w- I would go down there and I would, just like when I was practicing at Texas, I'd snap the ball into the goalpost, you know, because it was a small thing. If I hit it, it's going to stay there. So it's a win. I don't have to go chase the ball. Yeah. But it's also, it also gives me something very specific and small to aim at. And so I was using the soccer goalpost, and I was, like, trying to snap it into the, you know, into the, the goalpost. And these... I call it, we called it Afghan TV, you know, because they're coming out to like watch me because they're just like, what is this guy doing? Why is he hanging upside down? Snapping yeah, everything thing? about that looks ridiculous. It is ridiculous. But yeah, I just worked on that, worked on that. And I came back and we're, we're in training camp and uh, trying out for, yeah, trying out for the long standing position. There's like 10 other guys that are kind of in the mix. Yeah. They'd recruited a couple people to do it. And every day I'm like, I'm bumping up the depth chart and eventually I get to two on the depth chart before the first game. So the first game is played. I'm not starting, but I'm the backup. And the guy that was starting had a couple of not very good snaps on field goal and extra point during the game. Yeah. I think I think, I think one of them might have cost, cost us a kick. We, we blew out the team. It didn't matter. But, but it was like, mm. yeah. So at practice that next week, Mac, I said, all right, you know, for Wednesday practice here, you guys are going to have 10 snaps from field goal extra point distance, which is a shorter snap. He was already going to be the punt guy. Like he had done well on punt, at least that, that first game. And so whoever has, you know, the better snaps out of the 10 gets to start on sa- Saturday. And, and I won that competition. And so I started three straight years after that. Um, and then the next season I, I, I beat him out for the punt uh, position too. So I ended up doing both punts and field goal and extra points. But yeah, I went from never snapping a ball to just a few months later, like starting at that, but it's because I put so many repetitions in. You can learn to do anything that you've never done before if you just put the work in. It's just people people often don't want to put that time in, and and I, and it might not have worked out. Maybe I never would have won the job, but I certainly would have come a long way either way, just with that time in. And and I think that that's we get so hung up on the result, like well, if it doesn't work out, what's the point in putting all this time in? And then we just never try. You know, you continue to defy the odds you know, after this, but how much of this success is internal motivation and how much of it is that com- uh, being competitive? Like, how do you, what's your relationship? I think they're the with- same thing. <laughs> Cause I'm competitive <laughs> with myself more than anything, very competitive with myself, but I am also competitive with the, the other people, the world itself. Like I don't, you know, I'm a big, uh, whenever there's adverse conditions, weather, whatever, I feel like this is my time because I'm not the best athlete. I'm not best equipped maybe for anything I'm doing or trying to do. At least that's how I feel. But when I have those moments, I'm like, all right, everybody else is going to crumble or let this affect them. This like inanimate, I mean, I guess it's not inanimate, but it's not human thing. This un- inhuman thing is going to defeat them you know what I mean or like make them feel like they can't handle it and I'm just going to embrace it and like this is going to be great it's raining perfect you know (laughs) this is awesome I'm going to have a wet ball it's the same thing just it's the same motion it's the same thing if there's zero people in the stands or 101,000 people in the stands it's the same thing every time just do it the same remember your you know your 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 sort of preparation and your steps and just focus on that and uh, it comes from yeah this probably this feeling of inadequacy or that I don't, I still don't make that much of a difference or I don't do anything special or I'm like, what's the point of me being here? Why was I uh, fortunate to be born where I was born with the family that I have? Like I very, what is that word? Not gift. Privileged. Privileged. Thank you. Yeah. I'm privileged. I am privileged. And it's not just a white thing. It's just, I, I, I'm just privileged. There's plenty of white people that I'm way more privileged than, you know? If you are born into America, you're, you're privileged relative to the planet. If you're born in America to a loving mother and father, you are enormously privileged. Yeah. I, and and I had some, those things. There's nothing wrong with it. There's not no. a demerit. No, but it's, it's not my fault. It's, an, it's you know, and I, 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 I we should we should hope that everyone has that. Yeah, privilege. I'm grateful for it. I'm not ungrateful at all. But I think with that I feel sometimes like I have to do more. Like I was to try and give back and trying to do and trying to, you know, to Take advantage of this this golden ticket, you know, and not just let it go to waste. And hopefully along the way I'm inspiring other people or helping other people to 
you know, do something that inspires them, help other people as well. But I just feel like beholden to this. Like it's just, just something I have to do or. You I, spoke I, about in some of, in, in many of interviews that about this, this feeling of running out into the field, holding the flag. Can you t talk about that? It was it, the very first game at Texas. I wasn't even playing in the game, but it was our first home game. And you know, all the walk-ons for the home games anyway, even if you're not on the travel squad, which I wasn't the first year, uh, you still dress for the home games and you're on the sideline, you know, and, and uh, all of us with a hope of maybe we'll get to go in, you know. Before the game though, that they they talked about, well, for every game we have a player lead the team out of the tunnel with the American flag. And that I think that had started, I'm not sure when that tradition had started at Texas, but it was after 9-11. Usually it's someone who has military in their family. Well, since I was actually in the military, I was given that honor every game to run the lead the team out of the tunnel with the flag. And so it was, it was a great feeling. It was like, it would settle me in, especially once I was playing, it would settle me into the game because yeah. this, I'm like standing out there, I'm thinking about other things, other than things other than football, people other than, than, than those that I'm about to play the game with, you know, I'm thinking of those that are overseas and, um, those that, that didn't make it back. And, and, uh, um, I just felt this like sense of pride and unity around this moment. And because of my time and service and what I did, that flag was very special to me, that symbol. And then also those thoughts of like, don't, you know, what if you trip and fall? What if you <laughs> drop this thing? It's like, it's, it's yeah. really weird, but it kind of helps you focus. You know, it's like, all right, this is, I know we're just running out of the tunnel right now, but I have to focus on these, on every step. And that translates into the game, you know, and, and that focus yeah, that I needed to do to do my job. So. It did. It definitely would help me settle in, and and also remember, like what at the end of the day, results aside, like what's really important here. You know what really matters. I was very um, grateful to be able to to do that. You exit UT, and you make it onto an NFL team. The for Seahawks short, for a short time. For a short time. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? The last season, we had a disappointing ending. We went to the Texas Bowl got blown out by Arkansas. It was ugly, one of the worst games I'd been a part of. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a call from this senior all-star game in Charleston, South Carolina called the Medal of Honor Bowl. And it was put on by the Medal of Honor Society. There was like five different all-star games that players are asked to play in. And they said, hey, would you snap in this, be one of the long snappers in this game? I'm like, yes, awesome. One more chance to play, yeah. just a game for fun. But it's like, I didn't want to end like that. This is perfect. So I go out there. And at practice every day, there's like a ton of scouts hmm. and NFL front right, office people that are evaluating these guys. And I'm, I just turned 34. And uh, I'm like, well, <laughs> they're not evaluating me. I weigh 185 pounds and like, I'm not NFL material. Um, but I had four teams meet with me and said, look, you can snap it as good as these guys in the league. You just got to put some weight on and, you know, you should go for it though. So I put on about... 35 pounds in four months, and not all good weight. Yeah, uh, yeah, can is it even possible to do that with good weight? I'm not sure it is, biologically. No, no, <laughs> I mean, well. You could do it with pizza weight. You could do it with, with, with uh, <laughs> other help, you know, from the sure. outside. right, right. Um, yeah. But they're testing Steroids for that. And whatnot. <laughs> sure. So that wasn't an option. I play in this all-star game, and then I was moving out to Los Angeles anyway to finish my master's degree, which was in advertising. So I, I finished my undergrad and I, I started getting this advertising degree. I wanted to go to film school still. They told me, since you're playing football, it'll be tough to do this yeah. graduate film program, but you should, if you do something like advertising, you can take film as your electives, like film-related classes. Right, and film school's hard like that. I mean, it was, it was like- You're filming all weekend, right? Working on you're, projects. You're, like there were certain majors that you had like studio stuff where you were doing projects that consumed yeah. everything. And film school is one of those things. Yeah. yeah. And so they just were straight up with me. I, yeah. I remember sitting down. I had you're not going to get to make a thesis them. film while you're playing football. No, exactly. They were just like, it's yeah. just not, we only let 20 people into this program every semester. And it's just not fair because you're going to take a spot of somebody and you're not going to, and it's group work, it's teamwork, you know, it's yeah. group work. And so I understood that, but I was grateful that they let me take these electives. So I took the did the electives, and then to finish my degree, I, my internship was with at Film 44 with Peter Berg. So Pete had done Friday Night Lights, Lone Survivor, like football, military-related stuff. I was like, okay, I get that. So yeah. I'm moving out to LA to do this internship and to take a couple more classes to finish my master's. And that's where I meet Jay Glazer, and I start training at Unbreakable Performance Center, which is his gym in West Hollywood, and he trained a lot of current and, and even former athletes 
at the gym. So I start training there, um, preparing for this and preparing for the NFL the draft. Yeah. Draft. The draft is in early May. Yeah. And so I move out there in January and And Jay's gym, I understand, he has ex players coming through. So are you yeah. ever getting to interact with former yeah. players and, like and a current, lot? There's current yeah. guys that are there in the offseason. Like at the same time I was there, there was like Jadavian Clowney, Odell Beckham, like great athletes, way better athletes than me. And then, you know, a bunch of tra Travis Kelsey, who just won the Super Bowl again recently. Like a lot of these guys are coming in the uh, in the off season and training. And so I was getting to train with these guys, you know. Yeah, that must have been awesome. It was awesome. I mean, I was <laughs> I was the least of them in every way, but uh, every physical way anyway. But it was uh, it was a great opportunity. And then draft rolls around. Jay helps me get an agent, sports agent and. You know, he was like, hey, everybody was like, it's a long shot, but we'll, we'll give it a shot. I'm like, yeah, I, I know. I appreciate it. I appreciate <laughs> I've, been, I've, been around, I've been around the long shot game for a while. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is, and my, my dad was a race horse veterinarian. You know what I mean? So it's been long shots since I was a child. And then draft rolls around. It's the, it was, they called it like the greatest day in sports history because it was the Kentucky Derby, Pacquiao Mayweather fight. There was like multiple game sevens in hockey and the NBA, like all in this one day and then the last day of the NFL draft and I didn't get drafted but as soon as it ended that's when they start to call and make offers for to sign as undrafted free agents so I got it first got a call from St. Louis Rams and then I got a call from the Seattle Seahawks and, and Pete Carroll called you know personally the head coach and they'd been to back-to-back -back Super Bowls and you know my dad grew up in southern Oregon so it was like the Pacific yeah. Northwest versus at the time the Rams were in St. Louis they weren't in LA so I go up there and uh, it was amazing I was there for about five months total I was there for OTAs which is organized team activities in the off season and then off season training and then training camp you know and mini, you know mini camp training camp um, and then I played in one preseason game I only got to play in one game but uh, then they made the next big round of cuts and I was on the chopping block there. But to get to play in that one game was unbelievable, you know, and it was a home game in Seattle against the Broncos who went on to win the Super Bowl that year. Peyton Manning was the quarterback of the other team. I'm like warming up for the game next to Peyton Manning and yeah. the Seahawks already the have big these, leagues. these legends on the team. And, you know, my locker was next to Marshawn Lynch's, like all these like really cool things that... And I'll then, never forget. remind me, did you get to run out the flag? I did. I did. Yeah. So, right before, we're in the locker room and the equipment manager comes up. He's like, hey, I, I noticed you ran the, you know, team, led the team out of the tunnel with the American flag during uh, your college games. Do you want to do it for this game? You know, usually we have a, a, it's like a service member on the sideline to do it or something. I was like, give me that thing. Yeah, of course I do. <laughs> it was really awesome. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but it, I feel like I'd be remiss if we didn't at least t talk about it briefly, and that is you wrote an open letter to Colin Kaepernick, and it's a very thoughtful letter about your perspective on, you know, sitting, sitting out on the, um, the national anthem from, the, from your perspective as a vet and someone who's proud to run that flag out. Right. For somebody that isn't familiar with that, what, 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 what do they need to know about why, like what that letter was, why you felt compelled to write it, because it's, it's a big controversy you're kind yeah. of stepping yourself into by, by doing anything. Yeah. So why did you feel like it was important to do that? You know, what did you have to say there? I, you know, I reread it, re it this morning before we started. And are you still happy that you did that? Do you feel like it was something that you, you should have done and that you're, you're glad you did? I, I don't know if I'm... I don't know if glad's the right word, but uh, I certainly don't regret it. You know what I mean? I, I felt uh, compelled to do it. At the time, I, I did have a lot of people hitting me up about it, saying that I should say something or do something. I guess because I was in the military and I played football. I'm like the authority on the anthem at football games or something. <laughs> You're Just, Mr. Patriotism. Yeah, you, have you, gotta... to, you have to do something. I'm like, I don't know. what what. It's not my fight, you know. To cap off the story in Seattle... After I ran out of the tunnel with the flag, I went over to the sidelines. And in college, we're in this locker room when the anthem is played. Like, the, the teams aren't on the field yet. But in the NFL, as everybody knows now, yeah. the players are on the field. So I'm on the sideline, and the PA announcer says, would everybody please rise, you know, and, and honor America with the playing of the national anthem. And so I kind of panicked for a second because I was like, oh, man, I didn't even, you know, I, I need to be standing cr properly and do all these, you know, yeah, do all these Your training. Should I salute? In. Like, I don't actually know. And because I'm not in uniform. For in uniform, you have to salute, you know, if you're yeah. in uniform. But 
So I, f I find the tallest flag in the building, I put my hand on my heart, and the anthem starts playing. About halfway through it, I started thinking of Brad and started thinking of uh, a lot of different things. Yeah, sort of my journey and, and also you know, those that are still over there fighting, those that didn't make it back, those that did make it back and didn't feel this sort of confidence and belief in themselves to do like something that I was doing. Not that they had to play football, but to just go for it, you know. And I got super emotional and I started bawling. Oh, man. And I couldn't, like, stop. And it was ugly crying. It was not, it was not <laughs> You're like, ooh, yeah. ooh, <laughs> They had it with this year, I think, at the Super Bowl. That's Nick, the best. Uh, Nick Sirianni, the head coach of the Eagles, his was, like, gorgeous. You know what I mean? He's crying. He just looks, like, this stoic. Like, <laughs> this yeah. stoic single teardrop yeah. rolling down. Uh, and no, no Sean Moreno. Um, and you're like, I put, on eye, I put on yeah. eye, eye makeup just to make sure yeah, it would be exactly. awful. Yeah. <laughs> I was not, it did not look good. Yeah, the other play, players that have been in the past, it's always like in slow-mo, it looks so cool. I'm just like, like, <laughs> it's <was> horrible. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so it ends, the, the, the song ends, and like a bunch of players from the team, Richard Sherman and, and uh, so many others, kind of huddled around me and, you know, dapped me up and said, they're, they're proud of me, and like it's almost like they knew I was getting cut. Uh, <laughs> they're like, "This but, is going to be your yeah. last chance to yeah. cry on the field before." <laughs> totally, but it was it was awesome, and it yeah it was a powerful moment for me. So fast forward like almost exactly a year later, it's the preseason of 2016, and we're in the middle of an election cycle. You know, mm -hmm. November 8th was the elections yeah. that year, I believe, and it's uh, you know it's Donald Trump versus Hillary Clinton. It's very divisive, and. Colin Kaepernick, who was a 49er, my favorite team, and you know, and also like my one of my favorite players on the team because we were not very good for a long time after Montana and Rice and and Ronnie Lott and Steve Young and this era of five Super Bowls over the course of you know a dozen years or so, and then we had sucked for like 20. Like <laughs> you know we I mean? mean the 49ers. The 49ers, yeah. not me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I always sucked. Yeah. But like the Niners were, were good for a time. We're really good. You know, the, when I was a kid, they were a dynasty. And he sort of brought us out of that, brought us back to the Super Bowl and the NFC Championship the following year, almost won it. And so he was like, you know, he was a hero of mine. And, and then I hear through the grapevine, first of all, and then through social media that, oh, he's protesting against the flag or against the country, you know? And I'm like, what, like, why is he, what, pro like, what do you mean? They're like, he's just not, he's sitting down during the anthem, you know? And a lot of it's coming from, you know, people that were very passionate about these things as, as, as I am, you know, the, yeah. those symbols and they were upset and hurt, you know, and I was hurt. And I was like, I was just disappointed. I'm like, God, man, like this is, this is like my guy. And then I go and I watch this like 18 minute interview he did in the locker room. It was uh, a bunch of reporters with microphones in his face asking him all these questions. And little snippets were taken out of that, and that's what the tabloids run ran with, and that's yeah. what the news you know, was yeah. shown. But it's, when I'm... There's a reason why trust in media is lower than trust in government. Yeah, <laughs> right. Me. It's like right. under 25% of the public trust the media, for good reason. Good, that's, uh, it should be. It's that progress. Way. Yeah, it should be that <laughs> But I listen to the whole thing, and it's like, he literally says things like, uh, you know, I've got a lot of respect for men and women in uniform and that serve in the military. It's not about them. It's not about that to me. You know, it's about people being held accountable when, um, when, when unarmed, basically when unarmed people of color are, you know, killed by police violence. And, you know, take the statistics out of it. And I mean, that just depends on who you talk to. And, you know, yeah. there's a, that, that's a whole nother ball of wax. But what he was essentially saying is like, they're getting paid leave when this is happening, and that's wrong. You know what I mean? And I, that shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. Something needs to change, and I'm not going to stand during the anthem until things change. And I was like, okay, well, just like we talked about earlier, once you hear that, even though I wasn't sitting in the room with them, once I heard him say that, I was like, okay, I can, un I understand that. I can see where that's coming from. I, I'm not like pro uh, sitting down during the anthem, you know, because of that. But he doesn't feel the same way. I do about those symbols because he has a completely different relationship to them that doesn't make his opinions or feelings uh, anything less than. It's just a different perspective. He has a totally different uh, experience than I do. You know, I have to respect that. I don't have to like it, you know, what he's doing, but I should respect that, I, in my opinion. People were hitting me up, and, and not, just, not just like people from the military or football players that were, you know, felt a certain way about it, but like I got reached out to from 
CNN, Fox News, MSNBC, all of them come yeah. on. I think they wanted me to come on and like debate the topic. You know, right, like, we'll right. get another person. Who yeah. are, what's your viewpoint? What's your opinion on this? That's what they would ask me. And I'm like, I mean, I don't, I, 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 I feel a lot of different ways, you know. It's not like I'm all for or all against. What's your sound bite we can yeah, use? Yeah, exactly. Nate? They want me to just take a side. Where's the sound bite? <laughs> they want me to pick a side, red or yeah. blue. Is it red or blue, yeah. man? What do you want? And then we'll find somebody else from the other side and we'll come on. It'll be yeah. great TV, cut to commercial. Great TV yeah. in the Thunderdome. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I just was like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. It's not going to be helpful. So the Army Times had reached out twice saying, would you please write anything you want? <laughs> We, you know, we just, we think you should say something. And I was like, okay, it's the army times. It's pretty harmless. You know, nobody reads that. <laughs> um, and I could write an open letter or whatever I wanted. And I chose to write, write an open letter to Colin. And I basically just what we had talked about today, you know, I kind of told my story in so many words. Yeah. This is why I feel this way. You know, this is my experience in Darfur. This is my experience in the military. But at the end of the day, like, I, you know, we took the oath to defend the Constitution, which includes the First Amendment, and, and that's something he was exercising. And so uh, I also respected that, and I respected, I want to see my country doing better. I want to, if we're not up to a certain standard, and, and, and there's a way to bring uh, attention to that and hopefully positive change to that, like, I have no problem with that. But, you know, this is why I feel these way, this way about these symbols, because I carried Brad's casket that was draped in an American flag. You know, when I hear the anthem, they played that anthem when we were liberated from Sears School, which is, it's a training, you know, school, but it's yeah. like you're in a mock POW camp. It's intense. You call it propaganda if you want, whatever. But this is how it, I feel different when I hear these things, when I see these things. So it was like, well, I'm just going to, I'll write this thing. And, you know, at least I did something. If people say, why don't you say something? I'd be like, I did. It's in this, yeah, go read this letter, you know. Well, they publish it. I wake up in the morning the next day. I wrote it in like an hour and a half, just kind of had a glass of wine and was <laughs> sitting there just banging away. And I was like, oh, this is how I feel. This is just honest, you know? They just said, whatever you write, we're just gonna publish. So they just published it, you know? I mean, I, I'm assuming they edited it or proofread it at least, but they didn't <laughs> change anything, which I'm grateful for. They blasted it out and it got shared a ton. Like it was um, through Twitter and whatever. Yeah, yeah. And it just was like crazy viral. I woke up to a phone. I was, I never had my ringer on. So I woke up to a full mailbox in my phone, or like a voicemail box and email, just tons of stuff. Social media is blowing up. It's like all these, mostly uh, sports journalists were sharing it, you know? And yeah. it was like everywhere. And I was like, oh man. <laughs> uh, but it was mostly positive. I, you yeah. know, most people, I think it was well, a lot the letter, of- Because the letter is not inflammatory. The letter's like, you were modeling discourse with that letter in my view. So I'm glad that that was the way it was received. I appreciate it. Yeah, and even most people in the, at the time, before I met with Colin, most people in the military that responded to that was pretty much like, honestly, I kind of feel the same way. And I think most people, who are, I don't know what the numbers are, percentage, but if there's like 10% extreme right, 10% extreme left, and 80% of us that are sort of somewhat moderate. That's roughly correct. You know, I don't know what the, yeah, I think the 80% right. in there were kind of like, yeah. And yeah. then the 10, the 10 and the 10 were like, no, you know, it's all this or all that. But the, the most surprising call I got was from his publicist. Colin, uh, Colin Kaepernick's publicist reached out and said he wanted to meet with me the next day. Hmm. Um, they were in San Diego playing the Chargers in their final preseason game. It was a military appreciation night because we were, we were approaching 9-11, 15th anniversary. Yeah. They're gonna do a flyover with like Navy SEALs jumping in the stadium, this whole thing, and he's gonna sit on the bench during the anthem. And it's already like, everybody right. knows about it. All week they've been talking about what's he gonna do. And so I was like, all right, uh, is it is there like media? It's not media thing. And they're like, no, no. She's like, no, no, because it's his publicist calling. So I'm like, right, mm, what's happening yeah, yeah. here? The middlemen. Yeah, and the she's spin like, doctors. She's like, no, no media. He doesn't want. It's not. He just wants to talk to you. He just wants to meet you face to face. And I was like, all right, I, I I respect that, in a big way. I went down there to meet him, and we sat in the lobby of the team hotel. Him, myself, and Eric Reed, one of his teammates, and we had a really it was a great conversation. Talked about our backgrounds and I heard more about his story, why he feels the way he feels and how he felt, you know, people need someone to, to sort of voice their, their fight, you know what I mean? And, and kind of bring light to this and attention to this. He, he felt maybe a lot of the ways that I felt, you know, like I'm in some ways 
blessed. You know, he's blessed with uh, great athletic ability and this platform. Like, I should do something more with that. The conversation was great, and and you know, same with Eric, and and they were just very. We were all very engaged and kind of curious, and I mean, nervous. And you could feel like the nervousness between all three of us because this was like already a big thing. And, oh yeah, I mean, this was like yeah. captured national attention totally. for months. And I showed him a couple messages from guy or one guy I served with in special forces and another guy who was in the Marines who was a double amputee and the guy in the Marines of the Marines was a pretty conservative guy and he put the, he's tweeted this thing that you know Colin Kaepernick even though I don't have legs I'll stand with enough pride for both of us when the anthem is played and and then my other buddy had sent me a text saying Nate you know I read your open letter I was with you on this thing but I, I just came from the tarmac uh, up in uh, Fort Lewis. And one of our SF brothers was flown back, you know, and they unloaded his body off the plane and his wife standing there on the tarmac in tears, you know, and they hand her this folded flag. And I just like, I just am filled with rage right now, you know, for anybody that doesn't respect that. And I was like, I, you know, I- Did you feel you it when you first that. heard this? Did, Did you feel the rage? I felt hurt and, and sort of, disappointed, you know, but I didn't feel rage. I mean, I, I was maybe a little upset, you know, and, and uh, uh, maybe even a little pissed off. So what comes out of this conversation? What comes next? Yeah, so he, he asked me, after I showed him those messages, uh, he, I mean, I remember him saying, wow. He goes, wow. He's like, I, you know, well, do you think there's another way I can protest that's not gonna offend people in the military? And I was like, I thought about it for a minute and I was like, no, I mean, no matter what you do, some people are going to be offended. I think it's just <laughs> there's no perfect protest. There's no. It's not meant to be. It's meant to be uncomfortable. Right. You know what I mean? It's right. and it's like I said. But if, if you're asking my opinion, I don't speak for the military or the veteran community or anybody but myself. But it's, you know, sitting on the bench, separated from your team, isn't the most inspiring thing to me. Like I, I feel like you should be alongside your teammates no matter what you're doing. And he was like, I mean, I, I respect that, but. I'm committed to not standing, you know, uh, until things change. I'm not gonna stand for the anthem. And I said, well then, you know, what if you took a knee? That seems like the only other option that makes sense. And now that I think about it, you know, kneeling, I mean, people take a knee to pray and propose to their future spouse. And, you know, when a player uh, is hurt on the field, the other the other players often take a knee out of respect, you know, until he's yeah. carted off or walks off on his own. Hmm. I, I just feel like that, that would be better, you know, from, in my opinion, <laughs> but he, and he agreed, you know, he said, all right, well, I'll do that. And I, and I was like, well, what, you know, maybe I would, maybe I can kneel with you, you know, I, I, and I, and I thought about it and it kind of, uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of went back and forth. And then I yeah. just really thought about like the perception and maybe I, you know, there was definitely fear on my side of like, uh, you know, well, and what, how that would have been interpreted would have been Com completely not. Yeah. Probably what you wanted. No, not what so, you, not not the reason why you were thinking you might. Right. So I remember messaging him after, and I'm like, hey, you know, I, I thought about it, and I just, I don't think I can, I don't think I can do that, but I'll stand next to you. And he was like, you know, I don't remember exactly what he wrote back, but it was something along the lines of, all right, sounds good, you know, cool. So I talked to Coach uh, Chip Kelly and uh, Trent Balky, the GM at the time, and I was like, hey, you know, I, Colin's gonna take a knee alongside his teammates, but I told him I'd be there with him, next to him, supporting him. If that's possible, <laughs> it would be good. And they were like, yeah, of course, you know? So they had me down on the, on the sideline for the game and the anthem started playing and, you know, Colin and Eric together took a knee and I stood next to them. And the number one thing I remember was, was the booing, you know? That's what affected me more than anything. It's like a lot of people were booing and I'm like, to me that was way more disrespectful than anybody ever kneeling, you know? I mean, Colin was, was 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 taking a knee and was you know his his head and chest were up and it was you know he was locked in and paying attention and maybe in some way I'm not sure I'm not going to presume what the his intention all of his intentions were but to me it it read like I'm respecting um, those that feel a different way those that well the fact that he's even taking your advice to do right. to do that the willingness is, to adjust is is, is uh, you know what's our natural inclination right with any kind of confrontation. It's like fight or flight, no, you're my enemy, I'm, and like, 
I'm I'm gonna not do the thing you say even if I even if I take a deep breath and it's reasonable. So right. he actually met you. Yeah. If you know if you're it standing a, in was, for folks that are like not on the same page with him about whether this is something that the appropriate, he didn't have to do. No, he didn't anything. have to do. He didn't have to do anything. He didn't have to reach out. He didn't have to listen to me. He didn't have to ask those questions. He didn't have to act on any of it. He did all those things, you know. And that common ground or that middle ground or whatever you want to call it felt good to me. I was like, this is, we have an opportunity here in the midst of this 2016 election. Right, you right. know, well, To like kind of gets worse to, after that. So. I know. But <laughs> I was like, this is an opportunity to, to we, yeah. maybe, maybe this will bring us together. And, you know. Not so much. But once again, to me, I wouldn't change it. I don't regret it. I tried just like I tried when I joined the military and went overseas, just like I tried when I was playing football and whatever else. And like, it's, to me, it's about the intent and the effort, and I did my best. <laughs> and I would, and I would say this. I think I would say the same things and act in the same manner. I don't think I would really change anything in that conversation, and 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 I wouldn't do anything different that day. I, I did, did the best I could. I want to now bring us up to your next big transition, which is you made a movie. So, <laughs> so I, I've been working in entertainment for 25 years. I've made some documentaries. I have not yet made a scripted film. I'm working on some, but you know, I went to film school. I wanted to make a movie. <laughs> I still yeah. haven't technically done it yet. You did it. So eh, Bravo, I watched the film Thank last you. night and it's a very powerful movie. It's gotten great reviews. The movie's also got a purpose. It's, got a, it's, it's a story that's rooted in reality and that also feeds into work you're doing in the, with, with, with nonprofit work. And it brings our two stories together. You know, your military service and, and, your, and your athletics. So what is this movie about? What is MVP? Yeah. MVP stands for merging vets and players, not most valuable player <laughs> in this case. You know, we bring together combat vets and former professional athletes, and we help them find purpose and identity when they lose a uniform. Why? Well, well, both of those careers end pretty young, right? They're very intense in a lot of ways. Of course, going to war and playing professional sports are completely different. Yep. But that camaraderie, that identity with a uniform, that sense of purpose and mission and team and like the high stakes and the adrenaline and then it ending at like 25 on average, you know. It's also life inside of a fairly rigid structure with mm -hmm. like a coach or a captain. So yes. it's, you know, you're cut, when you're cut loose, you're not just cut loose out of all those things. You're also like back on your own as a free agent in the world with no coach or captain to tell you what you're gonna do tomorrow. No, no reason to get up for 6 a.m. workouts, which both sides do all the time. You know, and it's like, it's, great for a bit, you know? You're like, wow, finally I can sleep in, some freedom, I don't have to be this place this time, this uniform, eating this. But after a while, you're like, I, you know, we, we wanna work, we wanna fight for something. Like, yeah. that's just a human thing. We want, we, we need that, you know? We need a problem to solve and, and we wanna win, you know, competitive <laughs> and like all those things. And, and when you lose those things, it's, it can be really tough, especially when, you know, ever since you were eight years old in some of these cases or younger. This is all you wanted to do. This is who you were. Your identity is wrapped up in this intense thing that you accomplished. Totally, totally. And, and then you feel so disconnected to everything when you don't have it anymore because that was your world, you know what I mean? That is usually like what you're into. That is also your job, but it's like who you are is what it feels like. And when I got cut from the Seahawks, that's the first time I felt that disconnection because I had football right from the military. So I had another mission immediately. I had another locker room and team. I didn't know that, yeah, did how you, much I needed that, but. Did you experience any post-traumatic stress? Yeah, of course. Yeah, and I still do, you know. Um, Football maybe kept it at yeah, bay a little bit. Yeah, and we talk about it, there's a line in the movie uh, about that, and it's, a, it's something I heard from another veteran on, on Ventura Boulevard in LA. We were just having a conversation one day, and he said, man, like, yes, I suffer from post-traumatic stress, but I think I suffer more from lack of traumatic stress, you know, and, and like right. feeling, I, 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 I need that. It makes me feel alive and I switch on in a different way and I feel purposeful and I feel like I make a difference. And a lot of people that join the military are running from something, seeking that, you know what I mean? And a lot of people yeah. that play sports too, like they, they, they sort of need that. And there's a scene in the movie, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna try my best to not give anything away. Yeah. There's two 
parallel stories. You play the vet, and then another um, an actor plays a, a, a retired football player, yeah. and you got you both come together, and you create your character creates an intense experience for him that. Initially, he's like, why did you do that? And then he's like, oh my God, I feel alive for the first time again. And yeah. um, it speaks to this, what you're just talking about. It's right. like a, a, it's a great scene. It's really a powerful scene, very effective. It is, it's like, we don't really want to be tranquil. We want to be out there getting knocked around. Yeah, I, I, austere environments are my favorite ones. I, I, felt, I felt this back in the Darfur. I remember sleeping uh, outside, you know, under the stars at this, at this refugee camp. And I'm like, I feel more peaceful and I got a better night's sleep laying on the ground there. And I feel more at home in some ways than I ever have. And that's weird, but it's just, a, a it's part of the human experience that we're, we, we lose with all this technology and change and comforts, you know yeah. what I mean? That yeah. like, that we still have, it's still, I believe, it's still part of who we are, you know, as human beings, as, a, as, as animals, in a sense. Well, yeah, we're not gonna shake off hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years of being an animal, right. living in fight or flight mode right. all the time. Right. Because, oh, we've got 200 years of it being okay and, yeah, not, right. and sleep in, in air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, so, okay, so I get, I get cut. I go back to Los Angeles. Right away, first call I get is from Chris Long. Uh, played for, he's Howie Long's son. Played for the Rams, played for the Patriots, played for the Eagles. And he started this clean water project where he was bringing uh, uh, clean water to East Africa and he was trying to raise money through the 32 NFL teams and he'd have captains on different teams. And he reached out to me, this is like literally the day after and I'm like, uh, I don't know what to do. And he calls me, I'm like, oh, thanks, thank God. Like, I have a new mission. He was like, Trying to, trying to do something with, with the veteran community, you wanna be a part of this? And I'm like, I would love to. So I went with another, with a veteran who was an amputee, and we climbed Mount, went out to climb Mount Kilimanjaro together and raise money for these clean water wells. And I was like, I felt, you know, once again, like I got this purpose, I got this, this thing, but it's like, that was that one time deal, you know, and then maybe we're gonna go do it again next year, but it was like, what, I need something all the time. And I, yeah. and I know a lot of people feel this way and Jay, Glazer, who, and I moved back to Los Angeles. He had that gym, he right? He had the gym. Yeah. And, and so you brought and that Jay up. Jay had brought up the idea of MVP to me. He said, hey, I want to start this organization because there's people, because I, th I was thinking, should I go back in the military? Like, what do I do? And he was like, no, you need to focus on where you're at. And there's a lot of people that feel that way that played professional sports and served in the military. Let's help all these guys. I want to start this organization called MVP. He came up with the name MVP, merging. I want to merge vets and players together. And I was like, that's awesome. Like, what are we going to do? And he's like, I have no idea. <laughs> we're going to figure it out. Because of his gym, I had recently met some veterans who were staying in this uh, homeless shelter on Sunset Boulevard. We filmed on location. A little bit of a spoiler yeah. here. We filmed on location in the film. It's called the Barracks. Yeah, yeah. They call it the Barracks. It's actually yeah. the Hollywood Veterans Center. It's now closed, sadly. Um, uh, but the Barracks... Uh, where a lot of these guys that a lot of them were in the infantry in the marine corps you know um came from different circumstances than me most of them didn't come from the family that i had so yeah. they ran to the military at 17 go serve for you know four years eight years whatever that is come back to that same situation where they feel like they don't have a home literally and they maybe make a wrong choice or two and end up in this place that's uh, helping them kind of transition back to civilian life but it essentially is, it was like a shelter, you know? Uh, but it was all vets living there. And I go down and meet these guys, and I was just like blown away that this even existed. And I was like, oh my gosh, like how, how do we get to this place? And one of those vets in particular, his name's Denver Morris, and he runs our Dallas chapter now of MVP, but he was living there. He'd attempted suicide three times. No. Oh. Um, but you could just tell he had a lot of passion. He was a leader in his core, you know, and he wanted to change and he wanted to do something more and so he ended up bringing some of the vets from that shelter up to the gym uh on like a sunday when it was closed and i met them up there and we just worked out just like six or seven of us for an hour or so and then we went and got tacos and we were talking about and these guys you could see these guys kind of coming out of their shell a little bit and just through that sweat and like training together and working out together uh, again together and um kind of just being around the guys and getting out of that place, you know, and feeling like, okay, like I, I belong here too. Like I'm, I, I should be in this yeah. gym. And I go and tell Jay about this. I'm like, dude, you got to come next time 
and you got to bring bring some athletes, you know. So he brings like Tony Gonzalez and Randy Couture. <laughs> <laughs> that's why. That's why they're in the film. Yeah, but yeah, he, yeah. that's what he brings. And so we 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 the next week we we train together and we have a huddle with these vets and these Hall of Famers, you know. And when you hear Tony Gonzalez and you get to hear him recreated in the film, he told that story that they tell in the film. I won't spoil that, but yeah. about him after he you know left the game and that struggle. And these vets, you see these vets, like, you see it clicking with them. Just like, dude, I have something in common with Tony Gonzalez. Like, I feel the exact same way, you know. And all of a sudden, they don't feel alone, you know. And they feel like maybe not only people in the military I can connect with. I mean, we all kind of feel this at times. And transitions are generally tough. And that's how it all started. And so we, we started the, the charity, the nonprofit MVP. It's been seven years now. We've got eight chapters around the country. And in, in 2020, when COVID hit, and we had to stop operating the gym for a while, we decided to, to make a film uh, telling our story about the genesis of how it all began. What do you think is the engine of that help? Is it that you're seeing people with a different experience going through the same journey? Because obviously, you know, players, they're talking to each other, vets are talking to each other. So you, what is it about two different worlds coming together that seems to click. You know, the, the civilian military divide is something that people talk about often. Like there's this, uh, I, I'm never gonna be able to relate to your experience and you're never gonna be able to relate to mine or whatever. W where in some ways that is true, uh, but in most ways that is not true, you know? And I think people isolate because they feel like I, I did this other thing that's very different. And I think on the reverse side of that, we maybe look at civilians, maybe look at veterans and be like, well, I can never relate to that. Like I'm not, I mean, they went to war. Like, I don't know what that's like. So right. like, I'm not going to have much in common with them. So I don't know how I can really help except for telling them, thank you for your service, you know, and, and I don't know what else to do. And, and the reality is like, we're not that different. We have the same insecurities. They come from a different place maybe, but they, they manifest themselves in a very similar way. And I think with the athletes and vets having much more in common with that, that team and the uniform and the short career and, the, and all those things, that's like an entry point to bringing two different groups of people together that actually are, have a lot more in common than they do different. And the, the hope is that that brings more and more people together who weren't athletes, aren't veterans, that also can connect to that. The vet, vets and athletes are, they're very driven and highly capable people that we you need, need out there leading, you know what I mean? We need them to feel like they, they still matter and they can bring more to the table. It is like in both cases, you've got people who have made it through wave after wave of filter to get to the place where uh, they, they were essentially the best and brightest for the task that they succeeded at. Right. You know, because it's like you, most Americans probably can't make it through basic training. <laughs> <laughs> they, I think that, see, I, I think or maybe they, they, could, they could, but there's things that keep most people from, from following yeah. through and getting all you the You just got to want to do it. And almost anybody out there, when we really want to do something, we do it. If, if we say we want to do something, that doesn't mean we actually want to do something. That just, that's yeah. just what we're saying. You know, actions obviously speak louder than words. And when we really want to do something, we go for it. And more often than not, after a while, you're like, okay, I, can, I do belong. I can do this. I'm not an imposter. You know, <laughs> once you really go yeah. for it. But it's hard to take that step because we're so worried about what everybody else is going to think. And, you know, well, if I fail, I'm a loser. You know, it's like, who cares? Like most people that the losers are the ones that never try, you know, and that well, that they're gonna ain't that the truth? It's so true. You 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 co-wrote the movie. Co-wrote the movie. Yeah, um, with, a, with a with a with a, a British. Uh, well, he's from Wales. I uh, served in the uh, in, in the UK military. Uh, his name is Garrett Jones, and he's a you know he's an author. And he actually came to me at an MVC. He came to an MVP session, and he came to me afterwards and was like, "Man, you gotta you gotta like." make a movie about this and like in my mind I'm like what about what we can't make a movie about this this is what do you mean you know and he was like I don't know like let's go talk about it and I, I told him the story about meeting Denver and how it all and he was just like that's the movie like these two people from totally different worlds you know and, yeah and we change obviously a character instead of it's me going to the to the barracks it's a it's a former NFL player but it's based on all these real people all one thing that's really important to note is all the veterans portrayed on screen are played by actual vets, including Dan Loria from The Wonder Years. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. Right, he's right, a, okay. He's a Vietnam vet. 
you know? So all those, all the vets are played by vets. Most of the athletes are played by actual athletes. Sylvester Stallone put his name uh, on the film as an executive producer because he believed in what we were doing with the organization and wanted to help, uh, you know, help make this thing happen. One of the things that, uh, that the filmmaking process ends up being a lot like, I mean, it, it's, on one hand, I've, I've always said it's like a construction job, but you are, especially on like a feature film, you are like a little band of brothers that are, that are on yeah. this mission to make this crazy thing together. Um, did you feel that when you were making the movie and it's like it's first time director and you're acting in it too, which is a particularly weird and difficult thing to do? Did you have that sense of that this is another manifestation of going on a mission with a band of brothers? Totally. I mean, I, I was fortunate over the, the, the three or four years prior to get some, some pretty cool acting gigs, right? And to be on some big sets. Yeah. And I noticed when I was on set, I'm like, man, this is like a military training operation. There's all these different departments. Very high, high, hierarchical. Yes. And, yeah. and they all have to work together, but at the same time, like, they got to stay in their lane. And, you know, the communication has to be uh, efficient. There has to be prepared for sudden change, whether it's weather or anything could happen. And something's going to go wrong every day. Murphy will rear its ugly head. 100%. <laughs> and you just got to be, you got to know that's going to happen, you know, and have your we call it a pace plan in the military, primary, alternate, contingency, emergency plan. Um, so you have all those things set out and this is your operation, you know, and this is what you gotta do and it's expensive, you know, but it's also like the stress, that, mm -hmm. but it's a good stress, it's you stress, you know, yeah. where it's like. If you're built for it, it's energizing. And yeah. if you're not, it will crush you. <laughs> it will crush, yeah, it can absolutely crush you, but it's like when you are able to create this thing and you get it done and then it works, you know, and people get it, and then you get to watch it with people in a theater, and you can feel the emotion and then be moved by that. Whether it's people that, the reason they're being moved is because they're very connected to the story or not, I don't care. I'm like, yes, like we did, you know, this, the, this is what we set out to do, and we did it, and it was really challenging and competitive and all those things that, you know, we feed off of from those communities that I was in before. It's very similar, you know, and that, like you said, that brotherhood, that man and brothers, like you, man, you, you're at each other's throats. And at the end yeah. of the day, you're having a beer together and you're like, we got through it. I'm sorry. You know, I, I me too. You know, I didn't mean it. Of course you didn't. I know. We're just trying to, we just care a lot about this thing and we want to make it the best it can be. Several experienced producers over the years have told me, look, if you can come out of making a movie for all friends, then you've accomplished something even more amazing than getting the movie done. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> Especially among producers, if there's any different visions of things, it can. Oh yeah. It gets contentious, and you you poured your heart into this creative work, and so. Yeah. No. I, all the things. Yeah. Exactly. One of the things that's um, a big focus in the film. There's a lot of photos of of I think I assume real vets, who have yeah. taken their own lives, and there are it's is it 22 vets take their take their lives. Each day, there's R a, roughly, roughly. Yeah. It depends on the, uh, the the data and all that, but yes, roughly that has been the number for a, a lot of years. So sure. grappling with people that you've gone through something already bonding and traumatic, and then to lose them is an experience, an extended experience that you know I wish was was not felt by as many people as it is. Yeah. But one of the things that makes me think about is we have this rapidly rising suicide rate among the civilian population in a couple of domains. One, one, one being our kids that, uh, you know, our, my son's generation, the Zoomers, they have the highest rates of su depression and suicide of any prior generation. And then, you know, we have, you know, the suicide rates are really high among young men. What lessons do you feel like can kids and young men especially, and women for that matter, but people who are, they're lost for purpose, they're lost for a sense of why they add value. Like the questions you were asking at the beginning of our conversation, like if I vanish tomorrow, will it matter? What's the lesson from your movie, but also from your experience that you wanna pass on to them to pull them back from the abyss? First of all, we're all capable of making a difference and doing great things, you know what I mean? And, and doing anything, probably even more so now, you see through social media and other places, like 
everybody looks like everybody else looks like they're doing great and having you know, having a great time and they're better looking than you and just better than you you know and you just feel that uh, and you can't help feel everybody feels that like I you know I feel that when I look at stuff and I'm like oh they're they're why, why didn't why didn't I, why didn't I do that why didn't I think of that and why why am, why am I not doing that and I feel like I'm doing a lot of stuff and yeah. I still feel that yeah. way I still feel that way everybody I think everybody does you know but you got to get off these things <laughs> you know and if you have any interest in anything, just go try it. I think that more and more people just feel this pressure to assimilate to something or it's like I have to look and act a certain way or if I don't do these things in this sequential order, I'm going to be unsuccessful and a failure and I'm going to disappoint myself and people in this world. People in my, And it's like... Other people don't really care that much about you. <laughs> and I, mm -hmm. and I, I'm going to say that, that's, not, that's not fair. They're not really that much worried about what you're doing. But I think we have in our head that everybody's, it's because we see it from our perspective that everybody's yeah. focused on us. And like, it's just not true. We've all got our own shit we're dealing with. And we've got our own uh, issues and insecurities and inefficiencies and whatever that is. Those are the main things that overwhelm us, you know. Uh, and everybody feels that way. So knowing that you're not alone in that, and that everybody is feeling all those things. And at least for me, the best way to, um, to, to break out of that trap uh, is to get outside of my comfort zone, not just actually outside also, yeah. but get outside yeah. of my comfort zone and go try something new and different and put, uh, be around different people and change my, just change the scenery. And uh, the thing that I wish I was doing, just start doing it put yourself on that path. Like the, the happiest moments of my life are never at the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. It's like when I'm training before I even go and I'm preparing and I'm like, I don't even know if I can do this. Can I do this? And like that excitement of just going for it and, and like, I'm gonna make this movie and the excitement of like sitting down and starting to write this script and figure out like, we're gonna do this. And the, those like, those feelings, you know, am I gonna, yeah. staying in the Motel 6 and preparing myself to go try out for the football team. It was awesome to play. I loved it, but I felt happier um, when I was just putting myself out there and getting ready to go try it and, and not, you know, not so worried about the result. I, I recently heard, it might've been on the Huberman podcast um, that the neuroscientist that's blown up in the past year. There's this weird thing that happens where you know, our, our brains reward us with, I guess it's dopamine. The point he made was we have to train ourselves to enjoy the process, not the, not the, not the destination, because being rewarded only by the destination ends up being this sort of self-defeating mindset, which, which is what I'm hearing you say. It's like, look, totally. you might not get to the destination. You might fail, but if you can train yourself mentally, like make it your mantra to like enjoy the work, like enjoy doing the thing that you're just gonna be better off because you, maybe you'll succeed wildly. But that, I mean, this, the film and your life, is, it, it tells that same lesson. Like you can try and, and succeed wildly and then you come out the other end of that and, and there, there can be an abyss waiting for you. Yeah. So if you haven't prepared yourself to sort of live in the moment and not put every, make everything about status and climbing a ladder. Totally. Like I said, try a lot of different things. But if you find that thing that's sort of the universe keeps pushing you in this direction and you're into it and it feels like the right thing, just go for it. And don't worry about this. Don't watch the scoreboard. Just keep playing because things start happening. And, and, and sometimes, all the time, you're going to have this idea of what the end looks like. It's not going to ever be that. So don't worry about that because you, you, in your mind, you're going to be like, oh, when I get to this point, this is how I'm going to feel or this is what this thing's going to look like. And the world and the, whatever you call it, the universe, it's going to take you on a different journey you know what I mean and you're gonna get a you're gonna be off course and adjusted in different ways and you're gonna end up in a totally different place but if you just keep moving forward and keep pouring everything you have into into it you're gonna feel at least I feel those 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 moments of joy and and uh, uh with the with the attempt with the 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 intent and the effort <laughs> I could keep going back to that but like who do you want to be and then be that person you know go do those things. Take the, fake it till you make it. Totally, totally. Fake it till you make it. But 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 keep keep your mind open and your ears open and your heart open because it's going to go in a different direction at some point, and that's totally okay. It's it, fine. It doesn't matter what your degrees in. You don't have to do that for the rest of your life. You know, but just go. 
What role did your dad play in giving, in arming you with the tools to do the things you've been able to accomplish? You've got, you've, it, through this conversation, if there's a theme, it's drive. Yeah. It's, you know, the psychologists would call it like conscientiousness. You've got a inner propeller that keeps you going through some really hard stuff, including war zones and ta taking on new challenge after new challenge when it's like obviously ridiculous. I'm going to walk on to the UT football field in my late 20s and get on the team. I'm going to get in the NFL. I'm going to make a movie. These are all crazy things to try to do. How did your dad help you get there? Just by his example. I mean, my dad, he was a racehorse veterinarian. He worked at Golden Gate Fields for, you know, most of his career, which is in the Bay Area. That's why I grew up there. And my whole childhood growing up, every, he worked every day, seven days a week, and he would get up at like 4.30 in the morning, do his push-ups, do his sit-ups, do his jump rope, grab a bagel, a cup of coffee, <laughs> go to work, be at the track all day, um, get home 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, still find a way to show up for his three kids and... You know, my mom worked as well. You know, she worked full time also. Um, so both of them worked worked a lot, but but also great examples of like still being there selflessly for the people in their lives. And no matter what, like those people always came first. So me and my brother and sister always came first. That's how my dad was. It was just that consistency, the work ethic. You know, like if you just keep showing up every day, you just be a good person. He did that, and I saw that, and never really wavered on that. Just a person of deep conviction uh, and integrity, and yeah, I was really lucky to have him as my dad. As we start to wrap up, I uh, I've got some questions for you that I like to ask of a bunch of our guests. All right, got them here hidden. We've had a heavy conversation, so these will lighten things up a little mm, bit. We'll see. When you competed against your dad, did he let you win, or did you have to earn it? I'm sure he let me win sometimes, you know what I mean? But, I, but, but not without earning it at the same time. It was never easy. He wanted me to, and still wants me to, compete at the highest level. You know, I'm not going to say he was hard on me uh, in, in those ways, but he definitely pushed me. He didn't take it easy on me. I'll say that. I remember one time we were skiing, and there was a, I, I used to ski race a bit, and he was a ski patrol. Uh, he was on the ski patrol. And we had these, like, this little course we could race each other on, and, he beat me uh, the first time down, and the second time we went. I don't know if maybe he slowed it down a little bit, but I beat him the second time down. But he still won the overall time, and he was very proud of that. <laughs> he made sure I remembered that. So, All right. What's the most dangerous thing you ever did as a child? So I, I learned to drive on a stick shift. and uh, In the Bay Area? In the Bay Area, yeah. And my, my mom let me God. borrow her car, <laughs> this little sob, you know, yeah. So like the hills. Are yeah. Like well, there those. wasn't really hill. Oh. There was uh, in the East Bay. It's less hilly. Okay. Right? It's, well, yeah, but yeah. you know, it's not San Francisco. But it was Super Bowl Sunday. I just turned sixteen. I had my license, and she let me have the car. And I went, and I was driving way too fast. We flipped three and a half times. Nobody had a scratch on them. We were all buckled in. It was sketch. So that was. Oh, no. It wasn't intentionally like I was trying to do that. Right. But it turned out to be the most dangerous situation you know probably just letting me drive at 16 unfortunately you know it is funny because of all the things that we worry about as parents driving is the one thing where the worry is actually legit 100 <laughs> percent legit yeah. yeah it's 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 dangerous out there all right next up what challenges your patience the most and how do you overcome it adults <laughs> generally challenge my patience the most i'm pretty good with kids and animals and all that stuff but when you just get the yeah but thing from people you know there's always an excuse and a reason why they can't you know you're like well, yeah but you, you should do this thing they're like yeah but I can't because that and then you say yeah but why not like you have this opportunity yeah but then there's that and there's this and they just I want to like shake them and just you know get them out of that mindset I don't know how to do it that and fixed mindset yeah here's all the reasons Defeatist. why I can't yeah. You know what I mean? That's what it is. Yeah, it's, it's just like, and it's a bit of a victim mindset as well. And it's just, it really frustrates me because there's people that have been through so much. There's always someone that's been through a lot more than you have. And they're out there doing it or trying to, you know. 
and there's just, there's no excuse. That's a great reminder. It's like, there is always someone who's been through worse than you have and is moving past it. Totally. And it's like, even if you don't have a specific example, that's a, I think that's a pretty ironclad statement. There's a lot of examples though. Yeah. You know what I mean? I mean, I look at people in the military, oftentimes those that come back missing limbs, go on to do incredible things, things they have never would have done with all four. Uh, and they're doing them now because they're even more driven and they're even more like, I survived this thing, you know, now what am I gonna do with it? Now I'm gonna do with this opportunity for life moving forward. It's like they have every excuse and reason to stay home and do nothing. And people would be like, yeah, well, he, you know, he lost his legs. Like, what do you expect? But instead, they're out there yeah. changing the world. All right, next up. Oh, I'm really curious about this. What does masculinity mean to you or what is masculinity? <sighs> Oh God! <laughs> In the deep water. That's a that's a tough one. Well, you you're, you you played football at at the highest levels. Yeah. Uh, you've you've been in the military and deployed. I mean, you've done the things that most people would say like are as masculine as it gets, are like very manly. Uh, these are maybe some outside the box um, thoughts on this, but you know, to me. The ability to admit you're wrong and to listen to another person, consider another opinion, uh, try to understand where that person is coming from, you know, recognize a fear that you have and then continue to take steps towards your goal uh, with that in mind and understanding that you are actually afraid of this thing and admitting that you're afraid of this thing. And you know, I think that fearlessness there's no courage in fearlessness, you know, if you're not afraid. People talk about that in war all the time. They're hmm. like, oh man, weren't you afraid? I'm like, I was terrified plenty of times. But I still was willing to do it. I was still willing to take a bullet for the man next to me, probably because largely I knew he would do the same for me. But if I wasn't afraid in that moment, if I had no fear, um, then I have no courage. The idea of masculinity is like the recognition of not <laughs> what would be considered non-masculine things that you feel those things, you know what I mean? You feel weak sometimes and you feel inadequate and you feel, you know, you, you, you're afraid of acting on that, you know, but you make the decision to not succumb to that, you know, to, to overcome that. I think that's masculine. I don't know, that's a tough question. <laughs> All right, coming up next. What did your dad teach you about God? You know, my, my, my father is, is a pretty devout Christian and what he taught, what he taught me just to, to have, you know, the utmost respect for that higher power and to, to just trust even through hard times that there is a plan uh, in some way, shape or form. And, and, and I, I wrestle with that because I'm not a big fate person. Yeah. I, I don't like the idea of fate because then that means I'm not in control of anything, you know, that it's just gonna happen how it happens no matter what I do. But I think they're like finding that balance and that mix of understanding that like, we do have this free will to, we, we, we absolutely do, we, we make these choices in life. Yeah. But if you make what would be considered the right choices, I guess, this is the path that you know, God has laid out for you and should lead to a happy place, you know, a place of contentment. Do you believe in God? Did, did, has, has God survived war for you? Yeah, God has, you know, the idea of... I mean, that's one of the biggest critics of, of belief in God is how can there be a God that allows things like yeah. the things you've seen to be in this world? Yeah, I mean, that's... And I think it goes back to that, that free will piece of it, and I think... I think most religions at some level teach that, you know, that there is still this free will that God is allowing us to do as human beings. We're making these choices. So we are in fact doing that, not, it's not God's, God's will. Um, that's what I feel and believe, yeah. you know, I, I, I don't think that he's playing with these chess pieces and just smashing, you know, all these people that he's creating intentionally, that doesn't make sense to me. Why would yeah. somebody do that? You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, yeah, yeah. I struggle with faith a lot. I think that's sort of the point. Like, if you believed wholeheartedly, 
with no doubt, then there, you don't have faith. There, there's no need for faith because you just believe this thing, right? But if you have the doubt, there is no faith without doubt. You know what I mean? If you have the doubt. Yeah, it's like courage without fear. Exactly, exactly. Darkness without light, whatever you want to call it, those things. Yeah. And that's why the idea of a heaven where there is no struggle or nothing to, no problems to solve is terrifying to me. An eternity with no problems to solve, because that's what makes me happy on earth. So I don't understand that. And maybe that's the point. Maybe it's something yeah. I can't understand. I'm sure. And it maybe is. it's a different set of problems that so, come. Totally. Like new Who ones. Knows? But like, I think it's generally taught that like, oh, this is a place where there is no pain and there is no fear. And there's just, it's just, everything's good. And I'm like, ah, I don't want that. If everything is light, <laughs> how do you know like it's hell. light? How do you know it's light? Exactly. There's no darkness. You can't, you know. Ah, yeah. I, I, Interesting. So. Yeah, I haven't thought about it like that, but that's, that's definitely true. <laughs> no, you're right about that. I don't want to sit around and just eat ice cream all day and do nothing. Mm -hmm. I want to fix things, you know? I want to feel like I'm making a difference. And maybe that's just the ego and, and that's the whole point that I'm not getting. Another light one. <laughs> what do you want written on your gravestone? Oh my God. <laughs> you can keep this one light. It doesn't have to be heavy. <laughs> He tried. <laughs> well, well, he tried. You know what I mean? I got to climb Mount Kilimanjaro with my dad the third time I did it. And it was shortly after my grandfather had passed away. So his dad. And it was a really cool experience to, to, climb, uh, to climb that mountain. My dad was in his 60s, you know, and we both, it was very emotional. It's emotional even when you're not with your, with your dad. It's just finishing yeah. something like that and there's a lack of oxygen and you're all <laughs> messed up, you know. But uh, it was a very emotional, uh, emotional thing. And my grandfather had passed away just a little before that and, you know, we, we were figuring out what to put on the headstone. And I think my brother actually came up with the actual, what we ended up doing. But he grew up in Southern Oregon on the Rogue River and the Rogue River is already a cool name, right? And he was, he yeah. loved to fish and they had a house on the river and all that stuff. So my, my dad grew up there and, um, but my grandfather had, you know, it, it built that house and all that stuff. So, you know, his headstone was pretty cool. It's just a quick, a quick little blurb and it kind of encapsulate, encapsulates a lot, but it said, a life on the rogue well lived was his, uh, was his headstone, which is really cool because yeah, he was really kind cool. of a rogue. He was a World War II vet, kind of did it his own way, you know? Yeah, so that was a good one. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to top that, but. It's a good place to start. You've got a benchmark. I'll let other people decide. I think, <laughs> I think other people should decide that for you. That's, that's fair. I think you that's know, right. I mean, How much distance can we have about ourselves? Yeah. Yeah, our loved ones. Yeah. We've, t we've talked about this already a little bit, but what is the number one lesson you learned from your dad? It's just, just don't quit, you know? Life is a war of attrition, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> it really is. And if you just stick it out, there's going to be something in it for you, you know? But if you give up... You're gonna regret that forever. Don't be so fixated on the results. If you had a lineup of all the people trying out for the special forces, trying to earn their Green Beret, and you were like, okay, out of these 100 people, pick the 10 that'll make it, you're gonna pick the wrong 10. They're gonna look a certain way and you're gonna have this idea in your head, but it's just the ones that don't quit. It's just the ones that they just show up every day. They're, sometimes they're the last ones to finish everything, uh, but they don't quit, they just keep going. Eventually, people, crack, you know, and people uh, make an excuse and give them themselves a reason to throw in the towel. But the ones that don't are the ones that win at the end of the day, the ones that eventually get there. And winning can look like a lot of different things, you know, and it might just mean you, you're, you're, you're content, you know, you're happy with, with the journey you're on. But yeah, I would say that's the, that's the number one thing. I ask this of every, uh, every guest, and you're a storyteller, so I think you'll appreciate the, 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 the structure of this question. How do you think about what your role is in the American story? You've had a deeply American story already. You've played a lot of roles in it. As you look ahead, how do you think about that? First of all, everything that I've done has been inspired by somebody else and something else. Uh, that's somebody that's already done these things. I, I haven't done anything that's new or different, right? I've copied <laughs> everything I did. Even we all have. We all stand on the shoulders of giants, right? Exactly. Even, even the, the script, the MVP script. Pretty, it's, it's pretty much transcribed from other people's, the words out of their mouths. You know what I mean? And it was like, okay, let's collect this into this story and, and make it into a movie. So I don't think I'm the most creative person in the world. I'm certainly not the smartest, but I, I won't 
let myself be outworked. Maybe it's pride. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but I won't, I, I won't let that happen. And so, you know, for, for, for me, when I look at uh, America or think of the idea of America, it is that, that freedom and opportunity to go after anything and try anything. And you're gonna get judged and you're gonna judge yourself and all these things are gonna happen and you're gonna fall on your face. If you're really going for it, you're gonna fall on your face way more than you ever achieve anything. But I mean, that to me is the, the most American thing, at least in, in, in my eyes. So I feel uh, very connected to the idea of America. I'm not always inspired by <laughs> our leadership or our choices or whatever, uh, a lot of things, or, or the things that I do. I, 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 yeah. I disappoint myself a lot, um, but I get back up and I try again, and that's very American. And I think as I go on this journey that I'm getting a little bit better every day. I hope I am anyway. That's the, the goal, and I think that that is what we should, should uh, strive to continue to do as a country, because we've made a lot of mistakes in our past and, and current, you know, and we will in the future but we have to be on this corrective course where we're trying to, to fix that and make sure that it's everybody's voice involved in that. And it's a very collaborative uh, effort. Um, and that's what I try to maintain with my life. Nate, thanks for being on Dad Saves America. It's been an incredible journey. I appreciate it, brother. It's really good to be here. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Nate Boyer. We'll put a link to his nonprofit MVP and his movie of the same name, down below. My key takeaway from this conversation was the concept of faking it till you make it. No matter how unprepared you feel, the most important step in your next life adventure is your first. Think of it like a law of life momentum. It's easier to keep moving forward or change directions if you're moving in the first place. Like Nate, you may even find yourself way ahead of those who seemed certain about their life plans after graduation. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with your friends and family and be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. At Dad Saves America, we believe that dads are heroes that play an essential role in overcoming the challenges we all face together. And now, a surprisingly awesome dad. I brought this magical gift for you to open. In order for you to open the box, you have to follow the magic words. Do you think you can help me to see what is inside? If you are ready, listen carefully to what you need to do. Wiggle your hips and touch your toes. <laughs> Clap your hands and touch your nose. Let's see what this box holds. Now knock on the box two times. Here it goes. Hope you love Step your back. magical gift. What's in Keep there? being the best you I can be. Buddy so. the <laughs> 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 Oh, oh how sweet. <laughs>